the mind is the source of all of our woes. And I can't, you know, like if I think about this stuff and let it get to me, it's going to be my demise. It's going to, it's going to kill me. The stress is going to kill me. Um, so the way I deal with it is like, just pe keep putting good out in the world. That's it. Be kind. Good for you. How can somebody say anything about that? Yeah, 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 they're going to yeah. say, what do you think? I say, what do you leave that guy alone, man? He's been yeah, home. He's yeah, been yeah. nothing but good. He helps yeah. people. Yeah. Come on, bro. We know he didn't shoot the guy, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but the fact still remains that there's somebody's, you know, somebody's dead and yeah. this service is something I'm going to do forever. I remember parts of Yonkers. I've shot one other thing like up in that area, but I don't necessarily remember the city that well. Well, it's a lot of hills. I don't know if you remember. A lot that. of hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yonks is known like it. I do a lot of running, and it's good, okay. you know, for that. Yeah, that's but, really uh, good. And 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 you're born and raised? No, I was born in South America. You're born in South America. Yeah, I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Wow. I was adopted when I was four months old. Okay. <clears throat> My brother Vinny, that I was just telling them about, he's nine months younger than I am. My parents, uh, my adopted parents, they uh, didn't think they could have any more kids. They had a miscarriage many years before. They tried and tried. Sure. Didn't think they could have any more kids. And my mom always tells me a story. She said that we looked at all these different pictures of babies. And my mom, oh, when I saw you, mommy, she goes, I knew I wanted you. And then they get, I guess they went through it, all the paperwork and whatever. And then she found out she was pregnant with my brother, Vincent. Wow. So then my uncle Frank, he had to come get me. My mother's brother was the one because my mom didn't want to fly with, you know, course, pregnant course, and all course. that. So yeah. my uncle Frank came down there and got wow. me. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. What's Vinny doing? I was, uh, Vinny's, uh, he drives the crane, he's a operating, uh, operating engineer. He okay. He drives the cranes and stuff and, uh, you know. Okay. So, you know, he does well. He's, oh, that's awesome, man. You yeah. guys close? Yeah, yeah, real close. Yeah, I yeah. bet, yeah. I bet. Uh, well, shit, man, I got to tell you, you, you know, you and me have never hung out. We've never, you know, most of the folks that I have, you know, come do the show and stuff, they're, they're, they're old friends or people that I know real well through somebody else. But you're just somebody who I've always, like, really admired you from afar and been very curious about you. Uh, you know, starting out, you know, when I was young and I fell in love with this acting thing, I looked at you and and and, and the work that you were doing, and and part of me was like, wow, man, like if, if this guy could do it, like I, I kind of got a shot, you know, like you were bringing something that was wow. like so raw and so real and so lived in, and um, and then you know when when I was first starting out, you know, in 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 um in the city here, like kind of like pounding the pavement, you know, and, and not, and really not looking good. You, you, you know, I remember sometimes you would come into like auditions, like, and you would come in with like a gang of people and like and kind of watch your whole story go through. And I've just been, you know, kind of watching you from afar, man. And, 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 and for me, I'm, I'm really grateful that you agreed to do this. I'm just so, I'm so curious about you. And, and you've always been somebody that, again, that I've just, uh, I've admired the way I've admired you and I admired the way that you've gone about things, I admired the way that you've owned things and, and, um, you, you know, kind of where you're at now. And um, so just, first, all, I just want to say thank you for doing this. Thank bro, you. For thank you for having me. I'm a very big fan of oh, you know, yours man. as well. Man. And you got a great career. And, Thanks, uh, you man. know, thank you. And that was really nice. I didn't know that, you know, saw me at these auditions and like, wow, like, you know, like, that's cool. You've always wanted to be an actor? No, not at all. I mean, I, I you know, it's weird. I kind of was, you know, I, I grew up um, as an athlete, you know, like that's kind of was my main focus. I played baseball and football, went to go play in school when I was a boxer. And then um, I got into a lot of trouble and had to leave school. Um, you know, it was always in and out of, uh, in and out of different institutions. And, um, you know, it was really not like looking good for me at all. And then, um, when I went to a co I went, I, I got kicked out of my first school, but then I went to another school, um, baseball coach got me in and I took an acting class, honestly, by accident. And there was this woman, I got her name tattooed here, but she saw me in something and she really gave me a shot. And, and once I got into some serious trouble, then. You know, I went to her and she'd given me all these books on acting and I'd really fallen in love with it. And um, she pushed me to go and, and uh, audition for the Moscow Art Theater and leave the country and kind of leave, try to sort of leave that life behind a little bit. And and I did. It really saved my life. She ended up marrying my wife and I and she really was like a, a, a guardian angel for me. And um, but But once I found it, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And it was right about that time probably that I first kind of saw you and your work and, and I was inspired. Yeah, that's that's like, you know, it's funny, like you didn't know that you wanted to do it until it was right there. And that was the same thing with me. I was on the beach. Yeah. I was on Jones Beach, in, okay. you know, in 1992. We had heard about this film, A Bronx Tale. And, you know, you hear so many, so many stories. And, you know, Jerry's got the part because they're going to use his aunt's store in the movie. 
So like all this, like, you know, so it's like such a long shot. So yeah. you're thinking, why would they want me, Lilo yeah. from Yonkers, to yeah. play in this movie? De Niro's directing it. And then I was just there on the beach that day, and it was just like, my brother called me out of the water. Because it was like a section four of Jones Beach out in Long Island. Yeah. That's where like a lot of the Italian kids hung out. So they went there to look for, you know, specifically there to look for a kid. And then my brother was like, you know, he called me out of the water and he said, Ali, this is the guy for the, you know, the De Niro movie that we heard about. And when the guy saw me, he was like, wow, you look just like him. You could, you could definitely pass for his son. So he wanted me to come in and read. And I had never done this. Um, and at that point, like, <clears throat> I wasn't really nervous because I didn't really think I had much to lose because I didn't want to do it. Sure. I'm not saying that in a sure. disrespectful way totally to De Niro or anything, but it's just not, you know, it was summer vacation. Right. It was July 5th. The summer right. just started. Right. So right. it's like, you know, I've got a whole summer in front of right. me and then right. this happened. So right. it's like, all right. But, uh, but once I went in there and they had me read the scene when De Niro, when I was shaving, but in the original script, De Niro was shaving uh -huh. and I approach him at the mirror uh -huh. and I say, uh -huh. dad, let me ask you a question. And just being in that room when she said to me, <clears throat> hey, here's the scene. You know, he, you know, the, it was a guy, Marco Greco. He said, here's the scene. I'm going to go outside, take your time. I'll come back and, you know, we'll, we'll read it. And once I was, once I just looked at it and I just saw it was like pretty easy. Like it was like self-explanatory, right? Interior bathroom, <laughs> describe the scene. All right, this looks like... And then we did it, and yeah. you know, and the, I, I didn't know if I was doing it good or not. I didn't know right. if I was doing it well. So right. I'm going off by his reaction, yeah. and his reaction was really, you know, a really good reaction. Right. So I was like feeding off this guy. He's like, "Oh man, that was great." So it's like giving me, mm. giving mm. me the fuel mm. that I need, mm. and mm. I'm like, "Wow, this is cool." Because mm. as we're going on, I'm doing more. Yeah. And he's like, "That's awesome." When I left that room that day, July fifth, nineteen ninety two, I was like black from the from the I was like yeah. the beach that yeah, there was yeah. all burnt up yeah, yeah. and I bought this little crystal I remember too it was like my good luck charm so I bought this little crystal and uh, when I left that room I knew this is what I want to do mm. this is what I want to do and you think do you think the buzz or the, the, the whatever it was the, the 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 thing that drew you in was it something that happened inside of you or was it the feeling of watching that person react to what you were doing and you knew you were doing it right and you were pleasing somebody what, what, do, do, do you remember it that specifically his reaction told me that I have what it takes yeah, yeah. to do this. Yeah, yeah. So it motivated me. And at that point in your life, did you have many? I, I just know for me, the reason why I put it out there, you know, I was like a decent, you know, I was like a decent division three, you know, yeah. athlete. You know, I was yeah, a guy yeah. who would be like a good sparring partner in boxing. But like, th there was nothing that I had ever done before that like, you know, adults or like professional people were like, hey, hey like you've got something. And I remember that really... That really was a motivator for me. Right. That, that, that shook me. I was like, these people are like... Yeah, yeah. because now it puts things more into perspective. Like, you can really do this. Not, you know, like, when you're doing it for, like, friends and family, yeah. and you do impersonations of other relatives, yeah. sometimes they're going to laugh and make you think you're good just so they don't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah. When you got somebody like that, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you said, it's very motivating. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like I went home and I started, like, you know, you know the book by Lee Strasberg, yeah. A Method to Their Madness. Yeah. So I'm reading books like that yeah. and stuff like, you know, I, did, you know, I got bit by the Total acting love. book. Yeah, 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 and I was, like, yeah. doing theater Start in my room. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, I want yeah. you to see something. <laughs> Call my brother. I'm on the bed doing things. You know, yeah, but that, yeah. you know, we love it. Yeah, we love yeah, it, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 so. yeah. And tell me, like, a little bit about, like, what's your life like? Like, what did you say, 92? Is that what you said? That was, yeah, that was so, uh, July 5th, 99. Um, so, 1992, who is, like, <clears throat> like who are you? Okay, like, what's, so what's, your, what's your life like? I just finished 10th grade. Okay. Right? I, ninth grade, I went to Sacred Heart High School. Okay. I was like yourself. I got thrown out of saying, I got thrown out of five schools. For what? Just, just, mis just misbehaving, class clown. I had good grades though. I was like, a, I was an honor roll student. Mm. So I got, I remember I got thrown out of St. Anne's. I'm, I'm, uh, what was it? Ash Wednesday in 1987. Mm. <laughs> you know, March 4th, 1987. Yeah. I'm good to date. So that was like in fifth grade. Then I got thrown out of Sacred Heart. And then I went to like a little upstate school. Mm. My, my family didn't want to send me to the Yonkers public schools. They were bad. So we used like a fake address. They found it. They threw me out of there. Uh -huh. So... Then that summer, it was like, I, I went to Roosevelt, but like, it was like, you know, public school in Yonkers. I used to cut school every day and it was like so coincidental because my mom, you know, my adopted mom, she's from Calabria. And, you know, Calabria is like a Southern part of Italy, yeah, right? Sure. That's like being in, in Belgium, right, right? Right, right. And meeting somebody from New York and be like, really, I'm from New York too. Where are you from? 
I'm from, I'm, you, know, you know those little villages? Right. I'm from, Tu. you're from Tuckahoe? Yeah. That's where I'm from. <laughs> yeah. That's how coincidental it was. My mother, my mother was from the same hometown as the assistant principal. Can you imagine this? And he played minor league baseball for the Twins. His name was Angelo Patron. Okay. Right? So... My mom was like, because my mom didn't want to go. She was hesitant, but she's like, listen, my paisan's there. He's going to take care of you. You, you got to go to school. You're in 10th grade. This is upstate. No, this is in Yonkers. Oh, in Yonkers. Because okay. I got thrown out of the upstate got school it, for it, using it, a fake it. address. So now we had to go back to Yonkers. Yeah. So my mom was, it was a little encouraging that her paisan, Angelo Patron, yeah. was the assistant principal, right? Yeah, yeah. So I remember what he said. I remember, like, because like, I cut out a lot. Because I just, because I, I missed so much school that year from being thrown out of the two other ones. And then the little in betweens of finding the next school. So I remember him. I said to Mr. Patron, we were walking down the hallway, and I said, Mr. Patron, why don't I just take off the whole year, and then I'll just start again in uh, September? Yeah. He goes, you know why Mussolini made the buses run? And I said, no, why? He goes, because he was the boss, like I'm the boss here. <laughs> he said, that's what he said. That's exactly what he said to me. That's why he made the buses run, because yeah. he's the boss. Yeah. I'm the boss here. You come to school, and you're going to pass, but just yeah. come. I went to school like 40 days that whole year. Yeah, yeah. I was promoted. I yeah. went, and then they found me on the beach. Like, But at that point in time, I didn't really get into the drugs yet. But uh -huh. I was drinking, you uh -huh. know, all day, every night with the girls uh -huh. and my uh -huh. friends. Uh -huh. And then I got thrown out of my house. I was sleeping in my friend's car. Uh -huh. I was sleeping while he was in summer school. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I had no yeah. direction. I was yeah. really, and I did head, head down a bad path. Yeah. Anyway, but if I, I don't know how much more could have, worse it could have been. Right. But that's who I was at that that's time. That's who you were at that time. Yeah. And, and, how, and, and at the same time, how was, your, how was your brother? Was he kind of doing the same things no, you were? My or was brother, he straight? No, my brother was straight. Uh -huh. Like, you know, sometimes I feel bad, you know, because they adopted me. My right. brother Vinny's a great guy. Yeah. He's a great stand-up guy. Yeah. Operating engineers, you yeah. know, he's good. But sometimes I think that, you know, he lived in my shadow. You know what I mean? Because my parents, After everything that happened. Well, even before. Really? Because my, Why? Because you were very popular or what? I, well, I was more outgoing, but not even that. It's not even that. Because my parents, they wanted to show me, like, listen, we love you just like him. Even though you're not technically our blood. They always loved him. They didn't neglect him. But because of that fact, they wanted to always go a little bit, you mm. know, a little bit more, a little above and beyond mm. to mm. say, listen, you, you're one of us. We mm. love you. Mm. Which I love them so much Horrible. for that. It's beautiful. But I think, you know, they didn't realize that my brother was going to feel that way. But I think he felt like he lived a little in the shadows, but he made the best of it. Yeah. We're still very close, yeah. my brother, and I love him very much. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, what's that? I mean, what's that like 10th grade? 10th grade, and then all of a sudden, I mean, whether you wanted to be an actor or not, I mean, De Niro's De Niro, and at that point, I mean, oh, that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 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 just like huge. I mean, what, what, what does that do? It was like, you know, because like at that time in your life, that's just when you're discovering new things, like new things, you know, you know. You know. So it just kind of seemed like it was almost supposed to happen after it happened, not when it was happening, but then mm. after it happened, it just felt like this is part of, Growing up, you know what I mean? Just because it came so easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like it was meant to be, kind yeah, of? Yeah, like it, it was, was like yeah. meant to be, but that's not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, you know, like, I mean, obviously we never we can never go back, but I think I should have, I don't know if I appreciated it as mm -hmm, much mm -hmm, as mm -hmm, I should have, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just because it came so easy. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to appreciate something that you got so easy. Sure. Because why do you appreciate it? Sure. You didn't do anything to get it. Sure. Sure. And I kind of like made so many, like, and Chaz Palminteri said it perfectly. I made monumentally bad choices. You know what I mean? Like what? Like what? Like, well, first of all, I chose to, you know, I mean, there was just because it came so easy. Right. And I'm thinking like, you know, I went from Bronx Tale, then I did Renaissance Man, then I did Crimson Tide. And I was working on all these A-list, you know, these big studio movies. And it's coming so easy that. You think this is the way it's supposed to be, not right. knowing the nature of the business. You're right. as good, you know, your last movie. Right. And right. you know, like, right. you know how I many times I've lost roles because this guy's got a movie coming out right, right, right. before that one does, so they're gonna go off that momentum. Right. But I didn't realize how it worked. So there was so many times like I'm like passing up on scripts and my managers and agents, they're like, dude, these are like the biggest people in Hollywood. Yeah. And damn, if I could go back, but yeah. I can't. Well, know? what do you like? Like, what do you mean? Like, you 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 would have you would have said yes to things that you had said no to, or was it just generally? Are you talking more like lifestyle decisions? It was more like there were scripts coming my way with big name people, producers, and stuff that I'm passing on. Not even reading the script, right? Telling right. my representation, yeah, I read it. It's not from you. Like yeah. it's not for you, yeah, <laughs> dude. This is the best script out there right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is, yeah. you know, these are the biggest yeah, people. What yeah. is not? What is there? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, 
just because you think like, eh, it's all right. I got those other ones. Yeah. They came real easy. Passing on this one's not a big deal yeah. because then yeah. another one will come. But yeah. it doesn't happen that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't happen that way. Yeah. And, so, I, and you leave high school, yeah? Yeah, I did. We tried that on location education thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and Bronx Hill is like such a big role. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you you know, you got five minutes, you go into Lila, we need you. You yeah. they, I didn't even take my jacket off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like, so yeah. Yeah. M millions of dollars are at stake. You playing that role right. They're not really that invested yeah. in education. You know, because I always thought I could always go back to school. Right. But this right here, you right. know, like De Niro, yeah, and I gotta right. really focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. so and did you feel what 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 did you learn there? Like what did you learn on that set? Did you feel like you came up with any like or was the work just always kind of easy for you and just to, to, to kind of fall into it? Um, I definitely learned a lot from De Niro. Um, one thing he always said, like, I guess not being a trained actor and going in sometimes because film just picks films. Like with film, sometimes I don't think you have to do things as big as you think you need to for do sure. them for them to come across a certain way. For sure. Because film is very sensitive. Yeah. And you yeah. come across doing less. Yeah. Yeah. Just as just exactly the way you want by doing less. And I didn't know that. Yeah. And De Niro always said to me, he said, less is more. It's not like, yeah. but it's like, you know, he really, he really, you know, like really said that a lot of times. It's not like, like it's not like profound or it's, but less is more. He yeah. said, if you don't feel like doing anything, when the cameras, don't do anything. Yeah. He said, you're better off doing nothing than too yeah, much. Too much, yeah, sure, sure. So sure. I said, okay, wow. So that that taught me to be a little more subtle yeah. in my approach. Yeah. And just like, and I've always, and it, it helps. It still helps to this day. I was like a big loser. I mean, everybody who knew me, they were like, John, like, what the f are you doing? Like an actor, like there was no, everybody made fun of me everyone's like why you know and 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 for me my only dream was like to go to you know be in like portland stage company you know like to just yeah. go get on a stage somewhere like do dinner theater like that's like i just knew that that's all i wanted to do and it's like i got these big ears my nose been broken 600 times like people looked at me and like they were like horrified they were like you can't be on tv like it's not gonna happen and like so for for you know many years it was like not happening you know and um then when I started to like get on movie sets and I, you know, I had little roles here and, you know, but as I did that, I said to myself, if, 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 if this had happened to me like 10 years ago, I would have like ripped this place down. Like I wasn't fit to be in, in the, you know, the amount of power and the amount of things that you have access to and the amount of attention you get and the amount of money you have and like all that's it just I would I was not I would not have been ready for that I'm always interested in in how somebody who just like takes off on a rocket ship like that like the, the way that you did what that would have been like what was that like for your friends like what was that like for that that, that seems like it would be an enormously difficult thing to to handle well yeah it, it definitely was like I said, my my parents were both immigrants. They're both, you know, from Italy. So it's not like they were able to give me any advice right. on how to navigate right. the proper way. And it's not like they were to... gearing you towards this. It's not like they were saying, hey, you should be an actor, kid. No. Like they weren't stage parents. I mean, listen, my, you know, like every Italian's fan of De Niro's, you know, so we all, all my uncles, <laughs> everyone knew who De Niro was. So that was just an honor and a privilege, even just to be, you know, to work with De Niro, who they, you know, we all loved. But for kind of for my friends it was cool because that was the time when we all started going out and it's like you know now someone close to us like you said has that access yeah. that power yeah. and it's crazy because yeah. it's like but you know like i've seen it at opposite ends of the spectrum to where you are that person who's going to making movies now like these a list movies and you do have you can move mountains you know like people see you and it's it's unbelievable the things they're willing to do you know, for you, just because you were in these movies. And then you see, like, as these movies, like, you don't do them as much because you're not making good choices and you come be, you become more of a liability. Mm. People are not going to call you and say, but people know. They know what you're doing. You're mm. going on these auditions. They see you're not the same guy that you were two years ago when they brought you in on something else. But they're not going to say anything. But then it, you just don't work. It was like, yeah, I saw him last week. He didn't really look, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, looked, and it's so, you know, the, but then I saw it, the whole other side of it. But it's interesting that you said that before. Like, like the way you were, you just weren't ready. And it, it, that's it's such a blessing that you were given what you were given. As hard as those when days you were. were. Ready. Yeah, yeah, as hard as those days were, you know, crying in bed, you know, my girlfriend who's now my wife, just being like, baby, it's never going to happen. I mean, like it was so impossible for me. It was never going to happen. 
But then now looking back on it, it's like I wouldn't. And and I and I I, I you you know I think about you 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 know the situation, especially you know that you were in back then. I mean, I I, I do understand what you're saying as far as like kind of taking it for granted and figure like it's just gonna keep coming in. I I, yeah. I, I get that. So you did it the right way. You you worked hard. You know what I mean. You 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 worked hard and you worked your way up, and you got to the point where you are now and you're doing great. See, with me, it's like. I started here mm -hmm. and it's so hard. Like, how do you do, like, where do you go from that? Like mm -hmm. you never mm -hmm. acted. Yeah. Now one of the greatest actors ever <laughs> yeah, is ever. saying, hey, yeah. I want you to play the lead in my movie. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? You, yeah. that kid from Yonkers. Yeah. You're like, what? You yeah, know what I mean? This is yeah. a big responsibility. Yeah. And you're a kid. I mean, you're what, 16 years old? Right, right. Yeah. And you, know, you narrated the film, there was a lot. It was a big yeah. responsibility. A huge movie. Yeah. So it's like, you peak so early. Where the hell do you go from there? Yeah. And it's so hard because, you know, like when you do drugs and stuff for the first time, what happens is it like imprints this memory in your brain and you never forget it. And like when you are in, when you did in, or are encountering something that you may not like and you want that escape, that memory is still there of what that felt like. So we go to that and say, hey, maybe I can feel like that again and escape what I'm feeling now. And, uh, you know, I remember we went to go see The Firm with Tom Cruise. Not not because we went to go see The Firm, but it was just me and my friends and my cousins. We were in the street. And one night we said, let's just go to the movie. And, you know, it's like, let's go to a movie tonight. So we went. And that was the movie that was showing, like, when we got there. Like, within five minutes. So we're in there, and this is, like, summer of 93. Bronx Tale's in the can, but it hadn't come out. Hmm. It was coming out in September. Hmm. Hmm. Right? So I've never really seen it. I seen little dailies. And, sure, sure. But that's not really the way it's going to look. Sure, sure, you know, sure, so, sure. So we're in this this you know this movie theater. We're watching these coming attractions, and there was like a couple, and then it said Savoy Pictures, and that was like the product. That was like who produced the Bronx Tale. Had the buffalo, the bison right. was their was their logo, whatever. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell my friends. Hey, you know, I'm not gonna do all that. <laughs> I keep the, you know what I'm saying? I'm, saying, I'm like, oh wow, that's like wow, that's the produced Bronx Tale. And as you see the logo, you hear Palmentary's voice. He says, all these years, what have I been telling you? And then when it, it cuts the picture, it's me. Wow. With this big friggin' hat on this 40-foot screen. Yeah, I know. Staying, and it was like, that, the excitement, the way I felt. You're there with your boys. It was like 10 times better than any crackhead I ever took in my life. Yeah. And it was like, wow. But it's like almost a, a curse and a blessing to feel that. Huh. Because it's like, I think any normal human would get addicted to that. It's like, when do you have, like, and especially like when you know and you're like, all right, I'm going to see myself, you got some mental preparation right, for this. Right, and it's right. like, but this one just clobbered. But this one's just like, boom, it's like all you these years, what have I been telling? It's like they snuck it on me. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. there was this. And then I saw myself and my heart was like, <laughs> and I was like, wow. I left, when I left, I was a different person. Like I left that. What was that? So you're sitting there with your boy. Did they go wild? Oh, everyone, my, the, the girls we were with, they started yeah. screaming. Yeah, my yeah. friends were like, yeah, 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 you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, wow. Yeah. And I'm still like in disbelief that this is me. Because you do the movie, you're around the near old. That's all awesome. Yeah, Don't yeah, get me But you're wrong. just trying to do a good job. Right, day. right. But yeah. it's not until you see yourself on there hmm. that you really realize like this is what it is. Hmm. And this is what this is going to be now for me. And you know what I mean? But, you know, even De Niro, he came to my house. He came to my house to tell me like, yo, this movie comes out. Your life is going to change dramatically overnight. And I, you know, like you didn't think, you know, like I, in this year, out the other. And what was uh, it? What do you think he was trying to tell you? Well, he had the experience. Like, you know, basically he was saying like, you know, I, I he, he had something, definitely the drugs, the drugs, but also he was very concerned about, you're going to have all these people that are yeah, going to want to be your friends yeah. now. And you got to be very, very careful. So a lot of these people don't have good intentions. Did did, were you, did he know that you were already uh, fucking around with drugs? Did he? No, know? I didn't. I didn't. I but didn't. he. But he was saying he was basically saying, "Be careful, this shit's out there." And it's yeah, yeah. I mean, I smoked like I, I've I've I smoked pot, but you know, and I drank, and I did smoke. The scene in the Bronx Tale when I say is it better to be loved or feared? That was the first time I ever got stoned, and it was on film. Wow! Imagine that the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the movie. Yeah. He was my good friend. He was supposed to play C. He was 21. The movie would have been a little different. Yeah, but yeah. he was like the, the guy. He, you know, after all the people they read, he was the guy that was like, you know, they were gonna they were gonna cast as Cologero. Yeah. And they found me on the beach. I was 16, he was 21. 
So it would have been a little bit of a different movie. Sure. I'm not saying he's a, he's a very good actor. Yeah. But I think, you know, just because at 21, I think you're already kind of made your mind up as, in which way you're going to yeah. go. Yeah. And I think at 16, you're right before that crossroad. And I yeah. think it's just means that I think it's a little, it's a little, it means a little bit more with the kid younger, but whatever. He drives me home one night and he's got some weed in the car. And I didn't even know what it was. So I was like, what the hell is that? And he was like, it's, he, I said, what the hell are those things in the ashtray? He had a Datsun 280ZX, the T-Tops, right? So yeah. he's got the, he says, right, he said, oh, he said, they're roaches. And now I'm really freaking out. Yeah. Tell me roaches. roaches. I don't look like roaches. <laughs> so he was like, oh, they think. So we smoked. I didn't get high that time. And we were in the Bronx. We were right by Van Cortland. And there was the pool. He used to be a lifeguard. Huh. So we like hopped the fence. He's got yeah. a knife on him. I yeah. got a broken bottle. And he's stoned, and he's like definitely different than he was in the car. I smoked, I thought I was stoned, but I wasn't really. Yeah, yeah. But then I smoked on the set of a Bronx Tale because I thought I was gonna be like the first time that I'm gonna be able to handle right, it. Right, right, right. So I smoked this time with a couple of guys in set, and when I went back to do that scene, I was like in a different world. Wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say that, but it is, hey, it, I mean, that's when like, it did happen. Yeah, I mean, but you know, it's just like the Nero and Chaz, they gave me, you know what I mean? Yeah, they yeah. definitely didn't want me to do that that day. They, you know what I mean? For sure, for, for sure. But That's all. also, you're a 16 year old kid, right? And right. it's like you, all these things are coming at you. And and I guess it's like you were auditioning. It's not like your parents had you in fucking you, you know doing acting your whole yeah, life. You set up in my room to do auditions. Right, right, right. You all of a sudden now are in this huge movie, yeah, and yeah, yeah. you're you're with your boys. And how how was that for you and your friend group? Like, how was that for you guys? How was it for them? Obviously, at first, there's probably elation and celebration. But when and if ever did there become a point where it was like, these guys are kind of like, fuck, I got this opportunity and these guys are trying to get me to do something else. Or was that not the, 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 the way? The core of friends that I had, they were a lot of them I'm still friends with. They did have my best interests at heart. And <clears throat> we all kind of discovered drugs at the same time because that's when you do discover drugs, right? 16, 17. But, um, you know, they all had money, but it was like we had carte blanche, any of these New York City clubs. Oh, there's Lilo. You know, like move the thing. You got grown men and women standing, standing out on. there dressed right. in their best outfits to try to get in this place. And then I come over there with it's shorts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, shorts. You know, red shorts. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? And and they are walking us right in. So yeah. there's you know my friends. I mean obviously they love that. Yeah. You know they love that. And you know we we came up together. We grew up together. But then it got to the point where like I don't know if it was because of the lifestyle. The act, you know it went with the acting or it was just me. Um, but I could see as we got older, they weren't doing the drugs anymore. They were starting to settle down, and it was different. And then me, it's like you know I started doing the cocaine, but then it's like. Then I was doing it on like a Tuesday night by myself right. with liquor in my room and I'm, right. you know, cutting lines off my yearbook because it's got right. a hard cover. Right. And, you know, then I realized this this may be a little a little different for me. This may be a little uh this may be a little bit of an issue. Yeah. And uh I just saw it's you know, like I'm doing that cocaine and it's like because it's like my mother always said in Italian, but in English, when the devil caresses you, he wants your soul. Yeah. And I could see the caressing in the beginning, none of the psychosis, none of the tweaking. So you just keep doing it like this stuff is great. It's great. And then you start seeing you change and, but you still give it another chance. And you think like you pray to God, like, please, please let me just go to sleep tonight. I'll never do yeah, this yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the next night you're doing it again. Yeah. And yeah. without any regard, without even any thought of what you went through the night before. Right. It's scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's scary, right? right? It's not normal. That's yeah. why it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. Yeah. It, how, do you, how do we go from this? Yeah. I was crying last night. I'm, you know, I'm, I was crying saying, please, just let me go to sleep, yeah. please. Yeah. And then, you know, God answers your prayers and you do That's go right. to sleep. That's right. And then it's like, but what the hell? Yeah. You know, why yeah. can't I stop this? This Like... You tell me I got to get ripped, I'll go run, I can work out, I got discipline, I got, you know, I can eat right, I can do, you know, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, I don't do, you know what I mean? Well, the drug, but now I've yeah. gotten to that, but I was able to do everything else. Right. But when it came to the drugs, I just couldn't do it. Right. You know, right. I had legal, legal matters, legal problems, all yeah. kinds of stuff, and you would think this would be a motivating force to say, that's it, man. Yep. And it just, it didn't, it got yep. worse. Yep. It was getting worse, like, what the hell am I doing? You, you, you become lost. My parents never did drugs, you know, and it's like, you know, it's just what it, you know, with the, like growing up a time where a lot of the old school, they look down on that stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? 
It's not necessarily my parents because they were good, but a lot of the relatives and stuff like that, it's harder to stop than you think because support, a support system is a lot of times what takes you over, you know, to get, for you to get clean. Mm -hmm. Because a lot, you know, like sometimes, you know, like I say it all the time, I'm no better than the next guy who didn't get clean. He didn't get clean because he doesn't have a support system like I do. I I fell so many times. That's right. But they picked me right up. So it was, it wasn't hard to get back on track. When you don't have anybody to pick you up and you got to do that yourself. That's right. It's harder. That's right. You know what I'm saying? I do. So, um, but now this is why I've, you know, dedicated a large portion of my life to trying to help other people because I want to be that person that my parents didn't have when I was struggling because they didn't know where to turn to. I wish they had somebody like myself. You know what I mean? Because first of all, you know, like the movie thing, like it's a beautiful thing, the power, you know what I'm saying? But now I want to use it this way because like. When some kid, even though like that movie's 30 years old, but it transcends time. So yep. if these people, yep. you know, if a kid sees it now, he's still going to love it and say, yo, I love that movie. Absolutely. Oh, C, man. Well, you know, especially these Italian kids. Yeah. Because C was like a prototype That's of right. like a That's Guido. Right. Right. He was like a Guido prototype <laughs> yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So he, all the Guidos <laughs> wanted to be like C. You yeah, know what I mean? So, I do. But now it's, but, but there's a, you know, like it happened. The bad stuff happened. But now there's a purpose for all of that. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Because this kid, yo, I loved you in that movie, and blah, blah, blah. And you can use that for Yeah, this. because yeah. a lot, you know, most times they're going to get better, even if it's for you. Yeah. But then eventually they're going to see it's for them. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah, they're yeah, going to yeah, see yeah. they're living, they're putting different things in place yeah. and they're living a better life. Yeah. And then eventually you outgrew everything you were doing and now there's no more room in your life. Because you've created a whole new life for yourself. When you got in trouble, what point were you at with your career? What point were you at with the drugs? Like, at, like, did you know at that point it was really getting out of hand? Did, were yeah, you still? Yeah. No, no, I knew it was getting out of hand. Um, my career wasn't really anywhere. Bro, I was 140 pounds, 135 pounds. You're showing up at these auditions, sunken in cheeks. So, so it was basically that. You were getting these incredible opportunities. You were working, you were doing Crimson Tide, you were doing that. And that's what, you're 17, 18 years old. Right. And then the drugs started to kind of spiral. And was anybody saying to you, dude, you're fucking, you, you, you're letting go of an incredible opportunity. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But more, not even so much about the career and the opportunities, like yourself. You got to, we love you, bro. You're going to die. Like, like how, how bad was it? Well, it didn't get bad. After doing so much cocaine, I started getting, you know, I started, uh, I started experiencing, you know, the psychosis. When you think like. People are like outside, people, you know, like not everyone gets like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing people get like that before I got like that. And I'm like, what the hell's wrong with this person? But then I abused it for so long. And then I started getting that, you know, then I started experiencing that psychosis. Did you know that that, that was happening? No, I yeah. thought it was really happening. But then yeah. after years of experiencing, you know, it's in here totally. and not out there. Yeah. So one night um, in 2000, before the Subway series, I was with my friends and I was really like, we were at my friend's mother's birthday party. So we were drinking, sniffing all day long. And I remember I was in the car with these guys and I got real paranoid. And I thought these guys were going to kill me. And right. these are my friends. Yeah. Um, and then I jumped out of the car. It's a little scar right here. Wow. Yeah, I jumped out of the car because um, I thought that was, that was better than what these guys were wow. going to do. But because I was so drunk and so high, I just went with it. Yeah. And I didn't, obviously I didn't die. So then I had staph infection. And that, the significance of that story is that is when I, that's when the doctors prescribe the narcotic pain medication. So enter the opiates in my life yeah. because of that, because for a real reason, yeah, a real legitimate reason. But I'm like, you know, even when like Dean thrown out of all those schools, like I saw a shrink and I saw him later on after the drugs. He said, I knew you would do drugs. I just knew your personality, just the things you talked about. Because, you know, I was adopted, so I, I attributed to that. I said, maybe my mom thinks, he goes, no, it has nothing to do with that. Yeah. He says, it's your personality. You always had that need for speed. You talked about loud radios and fast cars. and it's, But he also, you know what else he said? Huh. He said, you would be very good in the dramatic arts. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> yeah, Donald yeah, Lupiani. Yeah. He did say that. Yeah. But then the opiates. So now, like, the cocaine had, like, really run its course. But it's like a dog chasing his tail because you remember that first few times that you did it, how awesome it was. Sure. You're still trying to find that. That's right. And you're doing so much more to get, you go, oh, maybe I didn't do enough. But as you're doing, you're twisting your mind even more. But now you start taking the opiates. There's no come down. You can eat. You don't have to go hide behind it. You know what I mean? You're right. in a motel room by yourself. The opiates, like you could be social and everything was great. So I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. You know, so I was taking these pills for this. 
But because of my addictive personality, one one didn't work. I didn't go to two. I went to three. And then before you know, I was like, I'm taking 20, right. 30. And then those were harder to come by. And then I started with the heroin. I never I never shot the heroin. This is about like, this is about 03, 04, 05. Okay. And you know, in 1999, I did an Abel Ferrara film. I did The Sopranos. I did a show on CBS, the Donnie Brasco series. So I was work. I was still working. I was doing. I was doing pretty well, but you know, it's like when you have that, when you have those demons, and you're doing all this work, yeah. and then you're making this money, it's like the demons call because now you they know they can be fed. Yeah. Like this guy just he just did three movies, yeah. so now he can feed us. Yeah. And it's like it's like as soon as the movie wraps, you wake up that next morning, and it's like it's right. Those demons are front and center in your mind. Like, dude, come on, let's go have a drink. And uh, it just got really, you know, it got really scary because I just couldn't stop. I was on, you ever hear of TASK? TASK, Task it's, it's, a, it's a, an acronym for Treatment Alternative to Street Crimes. It was a, like a probation okay. type of thing. Okay. And I was on for TASK and everything. And even, you know, back in the day when I was on probation and I had to stop, I stopped. I stopped smoking yeah. weed. You know, I was able to do well, it. You, because you would get caught with your, I mean, what were you put on task force? What were you put on probation for? Was well, minor offenses? Or? Well, no, I got, yeah, possession. That was pretty much it. I got four four bags of heroin um, right on Yonkers Avenue. They pulled me over. Um, and like I said, when I was younger and I had, a, like I was on probation, I was able to just stop. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was going to be the case then, you know, but it just wasn't. And then I knew like, this is going to be a problem. It really. There's no way I would have stopped if I didn't get in trouble. Wow. There's absolutely yeah, no way. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, there's no yeah. way God saved me. Yeah. And I look at that. You know, that police officer that lost his life. And I know his family don't want to hear this, but I look yeah. at that 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 guy as like my as the angel. Like he was an angel. He was my angel. Like yeah. he left the earth. Yeah. To leave. You know, for me, like like I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna die. But you gotta. You know. Wow. That's the way I look at it. Wow. Because you know what I mean. Wow. And uh. It is what it is. I can't go back and you know bring him back. But believe me, there's not there's not one day that goes by that I don't think about that. Yeah, he's you with know. you. Yeah. And 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 tell me about that. T tell me about what happened that if you if you would like tell me about what happened that day and, and where you were at and how that went down. Well, you know, uh, well, you know, there was the other gentleman and the other guy involved who died in prison. By the way, uh, January second, he died of uh, throat cancer. Hmm. But uh, he was my girlfriend's father. Okay, she was going to school. She was going to take her MCATs to go to medical school. And she was doing really well. She was going to Fordham College. And when we first met, you know, I was pretty good too. But then after two years, my drug addiction spiraled really out of control. And this guy, her father, he lived downstairs. He was nuts. He was already, you know, in state prison a few times. And uh, so he was like the loophole. I only really became friends with him as a reason to go by the house because her or her sister would always call the cops. So now I'm like, let me latch on to this guy. Let me say this guy's my friend. So then I could just say, hey, I'm not here to see you. I'm here to see, you know? Yeah. Because she gave me a million chances. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, Bundles yeah. of heroin, crack pipes everywhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, and yeah, it's not going to yeah. get better. Yeah, so I tell people, yeah. you're not going to wake up one day and you're just going to outgrow this right, like a kid right, outgrows right, a jacket. Right, right. Like there was nothing, like I felt there was no more hope because it's like you're sliding and you just can't get you. This, it's gotten to the point where my, my like, People told me, dude, you keep, my, my friend Jimmy, he told me, he said, man, you keep messing with that crack pipe, it's going to get you one day. And I remember the day it got me, because from that day, I was never What eating. happened that day? <clears throat> I was with these, these kind of like these, well, I wasn't with them. This is a cool little story, too. I had another case going, right? I had another, the one I got, I got pulled over, four bags of heroin. So now I'm going to court, back and forth, for this. I'm with my, the girl who was... The daughter of the guy. Yeah. So we're at court one day. It was just a regular court date. So now when I'm outside, I see these two detectives. They're Yonkers, Yonkers, you know, cops, Yonkers detectives. And there was this one guy, his name was Frank. I won't say his last name, but his name was Frank. He had the ponytail, you know, he looked like Seagal. So he's out there. Hey, what's up, man? So we started talking and uh, he said, uh, you know, he says, uh, you know, he says, yeah, I heard you got a little case going and something like that. And he says, uh, he says, maybe I could help you out with that. And I'm like, I was like, no, nah, I'm not real. You know what I mean? Because I, I kind of thought that's what he went. He goes, no, 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 trust me. It's not that. It's going to blow your mind, but trust me, it's not that. So I said, all right. He says, all right. He goes, hey, take my number. You know, give me a number. We'll, we'll stay in touch. So then he gets in touch with me and he says, he says, yeah, I want to talk to you. Remember that thing I was telling you about? He goes, let's meet. He goes, um, you know, he goes, 
wealthy field. I don't know if I don't know if you shot near this, but so we're at well. I he's already there, and then I pull in. And this is not this is not the way I live my life. I'm not gonna go tell on people. It's yeah. not even a big deal. I wouldn't. I didn't do it on the big thing. Right. I'm not gonna go do it on the little thing. Right. You know what I mean? So. So he's already in there, and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of a little nervous because he said that's not what he wants. That's not what he, he's so thinking. What, does what he the want? hell yeah, does yeah, this yeah. guy want? Yeah, yeah. You're you gonna like this because I'm sure stuff like this has happened to you. So I pull up, and then like I pull up. I didn't get out yet. He was like, "Gee, come in my car, right?" So now I'm thinking, "Oh my god." If he would have said, let me come in yours, it's different. Absolutely. Because now I come in mine, he may have some kind of recorder in there. Totally. He's got the whole thing set up. Fucking it. And you know what I mean? So I'm like, when he said that, I'm like, ugh. Because I didn't want to say, no, you come in here. So I didn't want to start off on the wrong foot. So I said, all right, I got in the car. As soon as I get on, he's got he's got the armrest. And he's got a fucking yellow envelope, manila envelope. So he's like, he goes, you know what that was? Tell me what's in that. He had his headshots. He had his headshots and his resume in there. <laughs> That's what he had. I couldn't believe it. And I told him, I said, man, this is a tough business. I said, <laughs> I said, you know, this is, it's tough enough to get myself right, jobs. Right, right, I said, I right, might be right. able to get you some, but maybe like walking in the yeah, background yeah, somewhere. Yeah, 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 maybe yeah, we'll yeah, see yeah, the yeah. ponytail or yeah, something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know? But that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. So like after I saw that thing, as soon as he pulled his headshot, I went like this. Yeah. yeah, it's all it is. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. all right. So, it's amazing. so that happens. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. This is like this. This could be a move, like this part. So when I come out, I make the right, and there's a stop sign, and then it's Lockwood Avenue. After you left the wealthy field. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. I smoked cigarettes. I smoked yeah. Marlboro Reds. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm at the stop sign. I was going to the mobile gas station. You know where the hotels were in Yonkers, the Royal Region, the. Down a Tuckahoe Road, there was like four hotels. Maybe, yeah, maybe. There was a maybe. mobile gas station. Okay. That's where I usually get my cigarettes. Okay. But because I was up on like the top of Lockwood at the stop sign, I said, you know what? Let me just go here. Instead of going all the way down, I park across the street and I, I see like a Thunderbird. I don't even know if they make those anymore. Yeah. Four Thunderbird. Yeah. And it had the, it was a two seater. You know, when you got to push this, you got to push this. So as I'm walking across the street, because I park across the street, there's two kids in there. There's a story, too, in Yonkers. When the guy drives through the laundromat, this is one of the guys that was in the car. He did this. But this is many years later. It's just coincidence. Yeah, yeah. So they're in the car, and they're talking really loud for me to hear. Oh, I like Lilo, man. He's a good guy. He never forgot where he came from. Kind of like to get me to say, oh, yo, what's up, man? I didn't even know who these guys were. Yeah. I've seen them. I know they're from Lake Avenue, but I did not really know who they are, right? So this is, this is, like, this is like June of 2005. It was like a weekday. I had nowhere in my mind to do anything wrong. So when I come, and then I come around to the sidewalk, he's sitting. So as soon as I get there, I lean down. He's got a crack pipe right in here, right? So as soon as he sees me, he's like, what's up, Lilo? How you doing, buddy? Everything all right? I was like, yeah. He was like, pulls out the pipe. He goes, but he never pulled it up the way they could see it outside. So he left it down here. And he went, you interested? Just like that. And it was like, I was like, yeah, I'm interested. Boom, get in. These guys know. They're not stupid. These guys are like white trashy guys. They probably have, between the two of them, probably got like $7 in their pocket. Right, right, right. right so they figure right, right. this guy does movies. Right. Let's turn him on with a little right, hit, and right. then he'll keep us going for like a week because he's got to keep going till right. one. So that's when, that day, once... And I remember. So the same day that he that 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 Steven Seagal gets you at at the field. Right. Five minutes later, my whole life changes Holy because I didn't go straight and I made that left. But that just teaches you life. But it's so like these little decisions that we make. I could have been in a totally different place once he. And then he was such a generous guy, such a generous guy. He had so much resin in that pipe that I was good just to hit the resin. Right. I told him, just give me, I'll just push that to the other side. I get all yeah. that resin. I'm all right. Yeah. He goes, no. He said, no. If you're going to do it, you do it the right way. He pulls out like a $20 rock. I was like, oh my God. So we went around the block. So I remember, I take that hit. The bowl is in. And I remember, I blow it out of my ears like, Ooh. and I remember him turning around and he's looking at me going, huh? And I could just see him in slow motion going, like, good, right? Good. Wow. And my ears are just, and I'm like, 
and that was it. That day, I was never able, after that day, I was never able to stop smoking crack every day. But I had a heroin habit too at that point because that's what I got in trouble for when I got pulled over. So I'm snorting like, you know, 15, 20 bags a day because I had the money. I refused to shoot. Massive. I refuse to shoot it. Yeah. People are like, dude, if you shoot it, you know, you spend two, twenty, thirty dollars a day. It's the same thing. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And uh, I never shot it, but I was up to like twenty bags a day. And the crack, it's not like the meth. You know what I mean? The crack, I was spending like five hundred dollars a day. Wow. You know, like what? You know the difference between the meth and the crack? See. Whoever helped made the meth definitely was like a chemist. Like they really had to know how the brain works. Totally. Because with crack cocaine, right? You know, you have dopamine receptors, right? So once you smoke that crack, <clears throat> those receptors open. Once you blow out that hit, that receptor closes. So you got to keep feeding it. And you got to keep, and that's why the crack is nuts. You, you're always constantly chasing that next hit because the, you, know, you got to open that receptor, close, open. But the meth is different. The meth, the receptors stay open. So that's why you get these people who take one or two hits. They're up four days four later. Days. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? And it's much cheaper. And that's why it like took over. Yeah. That's yeah. why you don't even hear about crack anymore. Because yeah, yeah. people are spending everything with meth. They got to spend a lot less. Yeah. But that's, you know, and that's and that's what my life was. And I was like, you know, spending, you know, thousands. I remember I spent 14000 in like a last, because it was in my checking account. That amount was in my checking account because my mom wanted me to go to rehab. My mom would cry. And yeah. She took money out of my other account just to put it in there and to, you know, for the rehab. And and I didn't, I went to rehab for like one or two days. I left. I took the bus all the way back from upstate and I was off and running. And then this guy told me too, because I had the S dots. You remember the Jay Z's, the S dots when they first came out? Oh, yeah. And I only got them by mistake. Somebody else got me another pair of sneakers. They were too small. I went to the store. They didn't have my size. I those are not bad. I didn't even know they were the S dots. Yeah, they yeah, just yeah. then everybody was like, "Yo, those are the S dots." I, yeah, I bought them by mistake. Right, 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 I didn't even know, right, but right, um, right. then I was like, "Yeah, I got yeah, the S dots." Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy in rehab told me he said because I left there, I said, "Nah, I'm going, man." I'm like, like "Lilo, stay. Trust me, bro. At the beginning is the hardest, bro. We got you, man. We got really good guys." Yeah, I bet. and the guy told me he said, "Bro, he said if you leave because the sneakers were still brand new, he goes, if you leave, you're gonna be fighting for those sneakers in jail." Mm. He goes, in, in not even a month. And he was so right. Because mm. that was like beginning of November. I got arrested December 10th. Wow. You know? So. So 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 December 10th, that's the, that's the day it all went down? December 10th, 2005. And, 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 and can you take us through that? Can you take us through what, what happened with that guy? Well, the night. You, I went to his house the night before. Right? I went to see his daughter. She wasn't having it. Right? So her and her sister were ready to call the cops. They did call the cops. He was a drinker. He used to drink up at the bar right up the street. This place called Murphy's Law. So he comes back, and when he saw the cops, he went crazy. Please. He goes, we don't call cops. Get out of here. No cops. So whatever. But the cops say they impounded my car. They, I had a, a, the Dodge Durango. It was in 04 when the Hemi came out. Because that they just had come back out, yeah. so I was very interested. I liked the you know the, the American muscle. Yeah, so I'm yeah. like this car, but it was a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. Not even twelve thousand miles was ready. It was creaking, yeah. garbage. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Dodge is definitely not gonna like me after this. But uh, yeah, it, it, <laughs> but they impound the car. So, you know, like and uh, like I'm thinking, like I don't even give a shit. I'm just thinking now I got to pay for this car. It's gonna take away money. It's gonna take some of the money I'm gonna buy you know drugs with. So now they take this car or whatever. So I go, but you know, I, 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 the car's impounded. I remember hanging out with my friend. I come home the night. My, I told my mom late at night. I said, mom, please. I said, uh, you know, they impound the car. It was December. So, you know, it gets dark at like 3.30, yeah. 4 o'clock. Yeah. So I remember sleeping. And I remember by like 4.30, you could already see the Christmas lights flashing from my room. They're already on because they're on a timer when it goes dark. So I remember... Because my my I, my mother knew, so I knew she's going to tell my father, oh, the car got towed. You got to go pick it up. <laughs> Imagine this. So him and my brother went to get the car unbeknownst to me. I didn't know. So as soon as I get up, that's the first thing I check. I said, did they get the car? So as soon as I open it, oh, they got it. So now I'm thinking, I got to go see if they're going to let me use it. Because I want to go get high. My The only reason why I'm up is because my body's craving heroin. Sure. I'm feeling sick. My legs, it always starts in the legs. 
and you get that rest. Of these legs can go, and then that's it because it's only going to get worse. So now it's time to get up. So this was all like this. My my father was not happy. He goes, "No, you're not taking the car. Get out of here. This and that." But I got to go. So I remember going to pick up that guy. He went to go buy crack with a friend's car. He got stuck. He told them, the guys at the bar, he was coming to get me. But meanwhile, I was going to get him. The, 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 the girl's dad. Right. So I do him a solid. I sit in the car that's hooked up to the tow truck. He's in the other car. I took one because they thought he was coming to get me. Meanwhile, I was going to get him. He borrowed this guy Mark's car to go buy crack, a Volvo, in the fucking car. <laughs> so the car, you know, like it didn't start. Yeah. So now yeah. he says, I'm in the freaking thing. So I remember I was so broken that night, man. And then I just like, after sitting in this cold car, cause there's no heat, the car's, it's freezing out. I took a few hits of crack. I got no dope. I'm coming down. I'm just like, and then I just get dropped off right on the street. And then I called my father from, and my father, he's old school, man. You know, he knew what I was going through, but he'll never say no. And he was always there for me. My dad, mm. got my dad right here. Mm. You know, he died mm. in 2018. My I'm dad sorry, was, yeah, yeah, thank you. So he picks me up and, you know, mm. he didn't even say anything, but it's just like, it's this dark street and I'm just standing there. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? Like in his mind, like what the hell? He's silent and that yeah. silence is worse. Yeah, so then I go it. home and then I make up, they won't give me the car. They won't give me the car. So then I make up some bullshit story that Scorsese was going to be in the city at this place. I need to get down there, mom. Network. Wow. I got a network. This is how I'm going to get more movie parts. It's not what you know, ma. It's who you know. Let me go meet this guy. Wow. Let me go see, right? And I says, you know, the place has an admission fee too, wow. right? So yeah. I got all this money, right? So yeah. I told him I'm going down to the city. Meanwhile, I go get drugs and it, it didn't take long. It's not even maybe an hour and a half. So my mother, and I come back home. And my mother's like, what? You went down the city already? I said, yeah, it was a really quick party. They knew it was all bullshit, right? So I go back in my room, right? I had some, I didn't have a lot of stuff. I got just, you know, I'm in my room. This is during the era of the next hell. I had the thing, the phone plugged. It was, I was about to go to sleep. I had the lamp. You just touch it and it goes off. He calls me on the two-way radio. And I never hung out with this guy after hours. It was just to go get drugs. I pick him up. We go to the Bronx. You know, the guys we know. They give us the heroin. I drop him off the bar and I go my way. But he said, you want to go out for a drink? And I said, yeah, all right. I was going to go to sleep. But I know, you know, we smoke crack together. We snort dope. We go to strip clubs. So that's, you know... So we went, we bought some crack on the street. I picked him up about an hour later. It was crazy too. It was like, he had the same color jacket as me. We had the same color shirt. We both had, it was like we had uniforms wow. on. We had burgundy shirts. Wow. And it you was, noticed that. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. As soon as I'm making it, because I had to make a U-turn. I was like, what is this guy? Got, got a hidden camera in my room. He's trying to dress like me. So he dressed just like me. <laughs> we go get some crack. The kid who sold crack, his name was Secret. He always said, keep it a secret. <laughs> well, it's not that much as if I know where you are, right? <laughs> So we go to the we go to the strip club, right? We go to the strip club, and my friend John ran that place. It was called Pretty Woman many years ago, but I think that night it was called Crazy Horse because they okay. changed the name. But when we went through, my friend John ran the place, so he was all the way on the other side in the metal detector. This is important because he said, "Have them go around. They're friends of the club." He was telling them, "Have them go around." So now they're thinking in court. This guy was in on it because he knew, because he, knew had you had, he had the gun on him. So that's why he told him, go around. Nobody knew nothing. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't yeah, yeah. even a guy like, I was lost in, in drugs. You yeah. think I'm thinking about this shit? Yeah. I just want to get high and go home yeah. and go to sleep, live yeah. to fight another day. Yeah. That's all I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we go in this strip club and, you know, we had some, you know, dope, but not a lot, but we had the crack. And when you smoke the crack on the dope, it eats away at the efficacy of the heroin. It doesn't, it's not that effective anymore. Mm. And it loses that the more you smoke. So mm. now we're really sick. So I said, listen, I got a guy in the Bronx, this Vietnam veteran, his name was Kenny. He lived next door to a little kid from Bronxdale who played me at nine years old. Oh, wow. He lived next door to him. His sister was my first love. So that's how I knew this guy. He was like this Vietnam veteran and he used to get like Tylenol or codeine. Like these veterans, they give him whatever. Yeah. They give him whatever drugs and he was giving me Valium and stuff when I used to fight with my girlfriend when I was 17. Wow. So like, it's like, yeah, I haven't seen this guy in all these years, Yeah. but we're still friendly. I'm yeah. not gonna go rob this guy. Yeah. He's a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. He's a Vietnam veteran. I respect what he did for our country. Yeah. He was a little easygoing. He was like yeah. a rain man type, yeah. 
Yeah, that's the way. His yeah. name was Kenny Scavoli. Yeah. So now I'm thinking he's got the Tylenol with codeine, right? Because I remember he had but desperate times called for desperate measures. We had yeah. a, a drug dealer in the Bronx. He didn't have anything. Yeah. So there's nothing left. We're sick. So you were going to go see the Vietnam vet. That was the last case scenario because yeah. this other guy, Joe, and he ended up testifying on me at trial. This guy, Joe Morelli, he testified on me, but we went to his house first. And he's saying, I don't got nothing. I was literally, please, Joe, please, begging him. No, his sister comes out. So then we go back to the Bronx, to the house. Now, listen, I know the guy's my friend. He's in the apartment. Did I use any finesse? No. I went there and I broke the window. You know what I mean? I broke the window with my the boot I had on uh -huh. because they found glass shards in the boot. Yeah. But that's not a burglar. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not, you know what I mean? I, obviously, it's not, the, I'm not doing, you know, like what I'm doing is wrong. I'm on private property and I'm breaking, you know, destroying private property. Yes, but it wasn't a burglary. There wasn't like, the intent for me was not to go in there unlawfully, you know what I mean? Knowingly unlawfully with the intent to commit a crime. I wasn't looking to commit any crime. I was looking to go in, wake him up. He would have been like, Lero, what are you doing breaking the window? That's yeah, what he would have yeah, said. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would have been like, come on, bro, please. Just, I'm going to call Codeine. Please, bro, just give me, I'll, I'll give you, please, just give me, I'll give you a few hours. That's what it was going to be. And he would have been freaked out, but that's not a burglar. This is what addicts do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I was a burglar, they, you wouldn't have heard me break that, that glass. Yeah, yeah, there would have yeah, been yeah, no yeah, noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm calling this guy, Kenny, Kenny, making all this noise. Finally, he never answers. So finally, I just abandoned the plan. I was like, fuck, what are we going to do now? This guy, we're between two houses. He says, all right. He goes, let me, he, want, he wanted to take a piss before we left. So now. The, the dad or the, or the Kenny? dad, the yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah. Kenny's nowhere to be found. Kenny, Kenny yeah. was dead. Kenny died of AIDS of July that year. Holy shit. And I, there's proof that I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm walking away. He's still using the bathroom. So as I'm walking away, because I know that house, there's a basement apartment. I used to do laundry with my first love in the apartment that the cop lived. Imagine that. To think that this is going to happen Fucking crazy. all these years later. So as I'm walking away, I hear, don't move. Boom, boom. He started shooting me when I moved. Got shot. Shot three times. So now I'm like, I couldn't believe what happened. You know what I mean? I just couldn't believe what he happened. He comes out the door and all of a sudden somebody's shooting at you. Yeah, he's down in the corner. He said, don't move. I moved, but he never said police. He said, don't move. Come on, John. It's 5.30 in the morning. I'm jumpy because I'm smoking crack. We just took hits in the car before we came out. So I'm jumpy and I'm paranoid already. Now this guy's saying, don't move. You're going to move. That's a, that's, a, yeah. that's a natural reaction. I didn't do anything. You know what I mean? So I just, that's, it was in, instinct. And yeah. I moved as soon as I did, boom, but start shooting me. So I guess I was like so high on the crack and my, my fight or flight and my adrenaline, it just kicked in and I didn't feel anything. And I'm like holding on to my stomach and I could see this blood squirting out of my, like through my fingertips. And I'm just like, I'm almost looking at this guy. Like, you know, it was, it was like this moment, like, why did you shoot me? I didn't do anything. You know what I mean? I had no clue what the hell was going on. Yeah. I didn't know that he was a cop. I didn't I didn't even know that he came from that door until later on, the case file. Because sure. he just appeared out of sure, nowhere. Sure, I'm walking sure, this way. Sure. Boom, and you're completely f***ed up. Right, right. I didn't know. You could have came from the roof. Right, <laughs> you right, know what right, I mean? Right, 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 I don't know right. where you came from. So now, as I'm walking back to the car, because we parked down the street. Wait, you, so you fall onto the ground? No, I didn't no, fall. No, you just... You yeah, just, I'm yeah. going. And it, was, it snowed the night before, so there's snow everywhere. There's blood and snow. So as I'm walking down the street, I hear more, more, more gunshots. And then I hear, I kind of knew the sound from the gun that I was shot. It was a K9, car nine. It was a yeah, nine millimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a smaller gun, but it is nine millimeter rounds. Yeah. And uh, it sounded like glorified firecrackers. Sure. Just a little bit more than a sure. firecracker. Like a little high pitch. Yeah. 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 Bap, bap, bap. So yeah. that's what it was. And there's no recoil. So he was bang, yeah. bang, 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 bang. But then I heard boom, that one big shot. Yeah. And it, like I was already halfway down the sidewalk. I felt the vibration yeah, in the ground, yeah, yeah, even yeah. with the with the snow, yeah. even with that layer of insulation. Like yeah. the, I still felt boom that, that vibration in my. I had no like people said, like, you didn't know this guy had a gun. No, I didn't. Yeah, 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 I was yeah. twenty nine years old on that day. Yeah, there's no history of me ever hanging out with people with guns. The yeah. DA was never was not able to put anybody on the stand that said, yeah, we always hung out with him. He, he loves guns. He's got a few, you know. He, yeah, yeah, he yeah. didn't have it that night, but he, you know, none of that. Yeah, yeah. 
So when that happened, I was like, what the hell? Because I didn't know this guy was a cop. So now, as I'm going, walk, as I'm like fighting for my life and going back to get the car, that's when I screamed, Kenny, Kenny. I was screaming for the guy, Kenny. I didn't know Who's he was dead. dead. Right, but that right there proves, that proves that I know he was dead. What do you, what, 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 why were you screaming for Kenny? Because I, I get, wanted... well, it was just, see, that's not a statement. That's what you call a spontaneous utterance. Right. This comes from the subconscious. Sure. Okay. This is where I thought in my subconscious where I had the most legitimate shot at getting help. And I really think, you know, I really think if I personally could have explained it to the jury, they may have looked at it differently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because think about it. Okay. You're saying my client, Lilo Broncado, is burglarizing this house, which is what means you knowingly offer, uh, unlawfully, knowingly enter and remain unlawful. So you know I'm not supposed to be in there. And the whole purpose of that unlawful interest is to commit a crime oh, but, did, but you never went in the house. No, but they got me an attempted burglary. Got it. But the fact that I called for Kenny, because my lawyer's been arguing the whole time. These guys are friends. This is what drug addicts do. He didn't go rob them. That right there should have said that. Because it's like, he didn't scream, police! He didn't scream, mommy! He didn't even scream for the guy he was with, Steve! Help me, Steve! No, he screamed for Kenny. Yeah. The place where he thought he had his most legitimate shot getting help. And if that doesn't say these guys were friends, I don't know what else does. Like, you know what I mean? I do. I just think as a juror, if I would have heard that, would it have been a slam dunk? Maybe not, but it would have made me think that there may be some reasonable, you know what I mean? I mean, did you immediately know that guy was shot or no? Who, the guy I was with? No, or, the, 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 the police no, officer. No, 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 I didn't know. What I thought had happened, yeah. right? What it seemed like to me was somebody was trying to rob us. Got it. So you I'm thought that the guy said, don't move. He was trying to rob you guys. Right, and then he just started shooting me. So I'm thinking maybe somebody saw us and is trying to rob us. Maybe they're just like us. Maybe they're on drugs too. Sure, sure. And they think we got money or something. So they're sure. trying to rob us. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. So when I heard that other loud caliber thing, I thought Steve got shot and right. killed. Right, Because now I'm thinking it's not only one. There's yeah, another guy. There's two, two I guys. got out of there faster. But enough. in a million years, you didn't put that gun on to, to Steve. No, I didn't. Yeah, 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 I yeah, didn't. Yeah. I knew he was nuts. Yeah. But it just, it's not like he ever said, like, look, I got this. He's not the type of guy that would do that. Yeah. And it yeah. didn't, it wasn't a night. We were going to a strip club. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We were going to a strip club, so I don't need know why... So yeah, that's what I thought. So now, once I get, we were like literally under the elevated train, my car's on the corner. Once I got far enough away from the danger, I guess my fight or flight just like gave out my adrenaline because I'm in a safe place now. So now everything started to set in. My legs got weaker and I literally fell on the ground and then I'm clutching and I'm up against the wall. Next thing you know, cops come from down the street. They were getting bagels down the street and they heard the gunshots. So they immediately, you know, arrived on the scene. They weren't cold there. They just heard the shots. And now they see me. I'm the kid from the Bronx tale. You know what I mean? It's like, it couldn't get more like surreal. Like, oh my God. He goes, there's the kid from the Bronx tale. He goes, what the, he goes, what the fuck happened? Yeah, yeah, he goes, yeah. who shot you? Was it him? And now my, the guy I was with, he's walking down the street, right? He's got the 357 in his hands, in his, in his hand. He's holding it. He's riddled with bullets. He got shot like nine times. Who shot him? The cop. And you didn't hear those gunshots? No, I heard him. Remember I okay. said I heard the smaller caliber and then the yeah. boom. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. But yeah. I was, oh, okay, I, was okay. walk, I was running, like I was walking away because I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was afraid. Yeah. The guy shot me already. And then when I heard the other gunshot, I thought somebody shot Steve. So now I'm saying I'm really in danger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, I yeah. couldn't, my body couldn't, couldn't cash the check that I would, you know what I mean? I was just too, too weak. Cops come on. That's the kid from the Bronx. Who shot you? Was it him? And then I looked and I said, no. I said, it was the bald guy down the street. Just like that. Because I didn't like him. The bald guy down the street. They saw this guy had a gun. So they told him, drop the gun. He uh, he did drop the gun. And the neighbors were saying, come here, come here. Because the, the cop was shot in the driveway. Okay. So that was their neighbor. They didn't even know who the hell we were. And then like ambulances came. 
and I remember being in the ambulance, I remember everything happened so fast, but I know it was really serious. I just seen like just the amount of people that were just coming as we were, you know, and I just wanted to say like, you know, I just want to say, I didn't do anything. And I, as when I was in that ambulance, it felt like everything was just shutting down. And I, I could, as much as I could do this, but as much as I was trying, no sound was coming out. So I thought my body, you know, like the lethal injection, just a, another part shuts yeah, off. Totally. That's what it felt like. I was just shutting down piece by piece. And I was so afraid in that ambulance. So and I told him, I was just like, I didn't do anything. And I was thinking about my parents. Yeah. Because, you know, they adopted me. You yeah. know, they gave me a better life and yeah. even gave me more than their own son. And now this is how I repay them. Imagine that as a parent getting a call. But but at this point, you're in the hospital. I mean, you're in the ambulance. Like, did you, and, and this instinct to say, I didn't do anything. You at, at this point, didn't you feel like a victim at that point? No, I didn't feel, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know that was a cop. When I was saying, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything for that guy to shoot me. Right. That's what I was saying. Right. Basically, what the hell did I do? I didn't do anything and the guy shot me. Right. No clue he was a cop. Right. None whatsoever. Right. I had no clue what the hell happened. And you didn't think in a million years you were in trouble at this point. No. You were, yeah, you were just what you didn't know why you were yeah. Right. Would it be surprising like to get robbed there, to get to get to, to get into a gunfight? I mean, what was that area no, like that's, at that that's, time? No, that that doesn't happen. That doesn't there's, happen. There's a there's a big organized crime presence in that area. But that kind of stuff doesn't. They don't happen. let that they happen. They protect that. Yeah, they don't let that yeah, happen yeah. there. And and right. and so that's one part of it. And two, in but it your was a life, residential, quiet, quiet neighborhood. And and in your life at that point, you, you know, had you been around a lot about was was that the first shooting that you had ever oh, had yeah. you ever seen somebody get shot before? Had no, you ever only yeah, yeah. in films, and oh, film yeah, and television. Got it. Got it. Yeah, got, that it was, got it. Got it. Got yeah, it. Got yeah. it. I didn't live a life like that. Got it. Got you it. You know, I mean. Just everything that I went through and it's just what I look like on paper, like yeah. this like gangster type guy. I'm not that. Of course. I'm not got that. it, got it, got I'm it. I'm not that, you know. I you know, I, I you know, I like to think I did the right thing when I did get in trouble. Yeah. I did my time. Yeah. I didn't say it was anyone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I wasn't a victim. Yeah. Because I knew that, yeah. you know, my bad decision making it made a contribution in the death of a of a cop. You're in that ambulance, what happens next? What's I the just, next thing you I just went out. You went out. And that was it. And, and so then, then you wake up, what, in the hospital? Right, but it was already 5.30 in the morning, so I wake up. And I remember I was on, like, life support. I remember seeing, like, detectives come in, but I was, like, intubated because I was on, like, they took out my spleen, part of my colon. I had a collapsed lung. So believe it or not, because I was a heroin addict, morphine wasn't enough. Wow. So I got administered fentanyl as well. Wow. Fentanyl, morphine, Ativan, and Versed. So I'm in. We had a, 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 an expert witness testify. I was in a twilight sleep, to where I made some degree of sense. But whatever I'm saying, it can't be. We can't. These statements shouldn't. You know, these 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 they should be thrown out. Basically, what we were saying because of the condition that I was in. But I don't remember anything. But then I do remember. This is when I knew because obviously the, they wouldn't have been able to print the paper, you know, <laughs> and have it out seven in the morning from what just happened two hours ago. But the next morning, it was on the cover of the paper. <clears throat> and I was on the cover of the paper with Richard Pryor because Richard Pryor died. Wow. And, you know, so just the irony. And what was, the, what, was the, what, what was the paper saying? It, was, it said, uh, cop slay actor. And they had my picture. And, and the guy, this one doctor, he goes, hey. He goes, you and your boy killed a cop. He goes, what do you think? You look great, huh? Something like that, like something real sarcastic. And that's when I was like, damn, I didn't know. I didn't even know anyone died. I saw me get shot. I heard the rest. I didn't know how that, you know, went down. I know Steve got shot, but I didn't know there was that that, you know, the, the police officer got shot. And yeah, I mean, just anyone getting killed, right? Just in that situation. It's like my drug addiction like led to this. Yeah. It's because of my appetite for drugs that someone's not here now. But then when it's a cop, it's it's, you know, a million times worse especially in New York, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I also want to say my heart and prayers go out to the officer who just lost his life. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so then I was like basically in tears when that happened. When I saw that, I was crying. Not because it was, you know, because I was afraid. It's because someone died, man. Like, you know, people always warn me, like, you're going to die or someone's going to die because of what you're doing. And then here it is. 
And that, and what is that like? I mean, to like realize, like it all floods in. Was it that moment when you knew, like you were done, like you were done, like you had to make it? Like what, 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 what? No, I no. wasn't even close to done yet. I wasn't even close to done. Yeah, I knew I was in trouble, this and that, but I still wanted to get crack. And I knew because because they didn't move us too far. They only just moved us to Jacoby Hospital, was which is in Westchester Square, which is like seven minutes from where I buy crack from that guy Borelli, Joe. So that's what I was thinking. I just wanted to get high. Wow. I was so sick yeah, in sure, my mind that I'm sure. thinking, there were so many cops in that hospital there for us, spinning on the floor, you piece of shit, all this. And I'm still thinking in my crazy mind that I could sneak out of here unnoticed, go see Joe and come back wow. like nothing happened, go right back in the bed. This is how nuts I was thinking. <clears throat> and then I had my lawyer at the time, his name was Mel Sachs. He used to wear like the bow tie. He was like a famous lawyer. He died though. But I didn't know how it worked because we had the uh, the administrative judge come to the hospital and I don't remember, it was some kind of formality, but the judge came to the hospital and it was Christmas time, you know, it was December 10th, December 11th. So I wanted to get bail. I wanted to, you know, I asked my lawyer, you know, uh, please ask this guy if we could get bail, get bail, because I want to go home and get high, really. But my lawyer told me something. He says, we shouldn't do that yet. We shouldn't do that yet. And I said, no, ask him if we can ask him for bail. He didn't even finish asking. The guy just said, no, denied. Because what happens is when you ask for bail, you're not, you can't ask again until there is a significant change in circumstances. So if your case is still the same, like statements have to get thrown out, and there has to be a significant difference for you to be able to say, can we, can we, can we get bail? And he's saying if you didn't ask then when the, you know, it was like all he did and everything, you may have had a better shot. But I wasn't thinking like that. But, uh, when was the first time you saw or talked to your, your parents after that? Like it, about two days later, the first attorney that I had, even before the guy Mel Sachs, that's why they retained Mel Sachs. He was my attorney for like when I got in trouble in Yonkers and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, he was, he was, he used to be a Bronx prosecutor and... He was a good man, but this was his, you know, his career, his legacy on the line, and being that he was came up as a Bronx prosecutor. My father didn't think he did as much as he should have, maybe in fear of what his colleagues and his people were going to think. So, I mean, listen, I, I, you know, this is where he came up, and he's been there before he met us. So we didn't really take it personal. We saw, you know, what it was, and then a friend of mine, uh, you know, suggested Mel Sachs. He's like one of the biggest, and. Uh, so then he was, he had the clout. He was able to get my parents in. And then I remember when I saw my mother, I was crying. I was crying. When I saw my mother, I was so happy. My mom and dad, they hugged me so tight. They knew, man. I knew too. Serious. How long before you were out of the hospital and then what, you went, you went, what, you went straight to jail before you, you cause you never got bailed, right? No. Yeah. They never gave us bail. So that was December 10th. So December 10th to the 15th, we stayed in Jacoby Hospital. Okay, then from there, they moved us to Bellevue, you know, on the East River. <clears throat> they moved us to Bellevue because they had that whole prison floor. So they moved us to Bellevue. We were there the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. And then the 19th, December 19th, 2005, was a Monday. So Bellevue wasn't bad. You got the morphine drip. You got milk and cookies every night. You could go up and down the hallway, go see other guys you met, who's playing cards. You got the phones, whatever you want. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too bad. And then they told us, but it's not like we have much stuff. They said, whatever stuff you have, pack it up. You guys are going to be being moved tonight. So I said, all right. So now they had us in these little, these little holding cells. And then you know, then you see these three guys go. It was two officers and a captain, you know, ESU, the emergency service unit, these big guys, all three of them are like six, four. And I remember, I remember the captain, his, his name was Ford. But he retired like not shortly after that. But he was a mean son of a gun, that guy. He was not playing. He, he told me, I remember just the way he talked. He said, strip down. He said, I hear one word from you. He said, you're going to be in the back. He goes, you're going to be back in the hospital. All fucked up. And I was just like. You knew he was telling Yeah, yeah. He yeah. said, if I hear one word from you, you're going to yeah. be right back in the hospital. Yeah. All fucked up. Because you're, you're now, I mean, you're a cop kid. I mean, that's what you are. It's like, that's, everybody's letting you know that's what you yeah, are. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. But they took us to Rikers that night. Yeah. That was the first time we've been there. And I've heard like horror stories and watched documentaries and stuff that goes on in this place. Yeah. And now to know, but I didn't know we were going there. So we're in this van, you know, with the metal, you know, with the, he's on the other side of the metal grate and we're all shackled with the black box. Yeah. I get the orange jumper on. I'm still ripped wide open. You know what I mean? It's cold. I'm scared. I'm in this dark van. I have no clue where we're going. He's a career criminal, the guy I'm with, so he knows. And you can see he's not that nervous. Who, right? Steve? Steve, I met, yeah. though. He didn't so you're with your code offense. Yeah, he's yeah, across yeah, yeah. with the metal grace. So I said, I said, where do you think I was going, Steve? He goes, we're going to Rikers. Well, I'm like, we shouldn't be. We don't know. So I remember turning around. I saw Dittmar's Boulevard. So now they get us into Rikers. And, you know, you're going through, you're seeing this nurse, and you, see, you hear voices. And, and I got a little methadone that night, but then they put us in the dorms. Uh, the, the, you know, the in the annex, the hospital dorms. And I remember we, they didn't put us in with the, you know, the general population. They did for our own safety. Um, so they put us in these back cells in the big dorm, the, the cells within the big dorm. So then the next day, like, everybody's like, you know, they're trying to intimidate us because they know we're there. So one guy's saying hamburger meat, like saying fresh meat, you know, just all the stupid yeah, shit, yeah. right? So then the next day, my co defendant went nuts because the deputy security, he was like, why we got to stay back here? So, you know, and the guy goes, oh, he said, it's for your safety. That's why. And then my co defendant said, what do you mean for our safety? Everybody out there is got is in a wheelchair. What are they going to do? You know, because it was a hospital door. So his safety, these guys can't even walk. So he says, all right. How was his condition? He was shot up too, but I was worse because yeah. he got shot like in the legs and stuff like that. I got, you know, like I said, I lost my spin, but he was pretty messed up too. But he's been through this before. Like the whole jail thing. In a way, thank God I had him there in the beginning. Because, you know what I mean? He was kind of like, you know, he, he he led me. He was guiding me. And he was like, don't say this. to Don't do an ask people. You know what I mean? Don't do, you know, he was telling me the do's and don'ts. Because he knew how to jail. So when they first let us out there, the, the Dep Andrew said, okay. Because he said, what, you know, the, what security? These guys are not going to do anything. So he said, all right, I'll let you go out there. When we went out there that first time, it was like, you're outside, everybody hates you. Cop killer, like you said, right? You cop killer, piece of shit. But now you're in a, this place where you're loved. It's the best thing you could have done. The best mm. thing you could have came to jail for is what you came to jail for. So now. And did you look at your own, I mean, to you, did you, you didn't look at yourself as that though, right? No, I was like I mean, this little like, scared rabbit. Yeah, I don't want yeah, anybody to think I was talking tough guy. Yeah, I yeah, was yeah, so yeah, scared. Yeah, Are you yeah. kidding? This is Rikers yeah, Island. Right. It's like hell on earth. Right. And I'm going into this place, you know what I mean? This big dorm. Right. It's dangerous. So like, I'm like kind of like walking near him. And when we came out, everybody went crazy. They were so happy to see us. They were whistling. They were making gunshot sounds. They asked my co-defendant because they knew he was the shooter. You got a couple of guys that asked him, what, what hand he pulled the trigger, what hand he pulled the trigger wow. with. They were kissing his right finger. Wow. You know, they, you know, like they were just like such hatred for police. Sure. They're like, oh man, fuck that guy. You got people pulling out their books. You remember Bravos? You got yeah. people off yeah, of Bravos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like we were like heroes. Yeah. It was like, damn, like a few days ago in that hospital, you got cops spinning on us yeah. and now we're in this place and they love us. Wow. You know, but I knew this was all fake and it was yeah. just, just a scary, you know, just a scary place. But, as time went on, because this is the medical dorms, you have access to drugs. They're everywhere, everywhere. This guy's getting MS Compton. He's getting, you know, Delauded. He's getting Tylenol or Coltine. He's getting Percocet. And a lot of times they get it because they got these conditions or whatever because they're in wheelchairs, but they don't even take this stuff. They sell it. And this is how they feed their family on the outside. So I met this one kid. He had the MS Comptons, the, the raspberry 30 milligrams. You know, like the ox... Because I don't know if you saw Dope Sick, but the patent ran out on the MS content. So that's when the Oxy came out. But it was like, so I was taking these MS contents. I had the guy. And then it's like I picked up right where I left off wow. in jail. And then they moved me to the other side, which was NIC, North Infirmary Command, because it's an infirmary. There's the annex and then where they moved me to. But then at church, I would go to church. I would see these guys. And then every Saturday we had our thing. We had our thing. I was getting drugs. And it was like, that you would think what happened, right? With the cop dying and that was like a rock bottom. And you would think like, you know, this guy's got to be scared straight now, right? Like, you know, it's going to probably go away forever. Cop is dead. Is that what you thought? Yeah, that's a, yeah. Did you already have any, sorry to interrupt you. No, did no, you, no, no, no did you Did you already, I, I mean, what, what I want to talk about 
the shame, you know, and I want to talk about, you know, sort of your proximity and how, how much you feel for, for this, for this guy who lost his life that night. How much did, had the shame snuck in yet? The, sh or, or the shame hadn't really set in yet because it was offset by the fear. Right. And the, 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 the willingness to still want to get high. Right. Because that was the number one thing. And right. now when You're I still saw, sick. yeah, now when I saw in this, in this, in this dorm, in this annex, Right, there's more drugs there than than on the street. Right, and they have these pharmaceutical strong the MS Contins. I never even saw them. So it got to a point I was taking twenty of those every Saturday. I was chewing them, you know, and I was just you know time was going on and on, and then you know like I said I got to December nineteenth two thousand five, November twenty second two thousand six. I'd been there almost a year, and I got my little routine. I got my you know Saturday we go to church. I see all the other guys that I don't know, and I was you know. And then on November 22nd, I took the morphine, but I also had another guy. He was a, he was a blood. There was a lot of bloods. I didn't know that that even existed on the East Coast. I yeah. thought that was a West Coast. They run Rikers. Yeah. They run Rikers. They did a roll call and yeah. everything. And I didn't know that. So there was this guy. He was in the next cell block. You know, when I was in, like, you know, not in the box. And his name was, his name was Poe, but he had like 20 different names. He was like a big homie, shot caller. He was very, like COs were afraid of him. He used to tell COs, go inside. I want to talk to this guy. They have a bundle on him. That's, that's how that place goes. He was in the next cell block. So I used to call him to the pipe chase. Yo! And he used to put it in the ramen noodles. And I used to get four bags of heroin. So that day I did the 20 pills. And then I remember in the morning, Poe, cause he used to get it in the mail. He said, I may be getting some soup later, so I'll let you know. So now I take the morphine. I should have just saved the soup. I should have saved it and sniffed the four bags the next day. You know, I'm like a normal person, but there's nothing normal about that. But So now I'm already high, I'm smoking cigarettes, and now those bags are calling me, man. They're calling me. Even though I knew I was high, I was good. I just should have waited till the next day. So there was this guy there. His name is Bobby Fahey. He was like a, he's like a petty thief. He's there every few months. Like one time he was there for a forged check, possession of a forged instrument. Another time he stole a map from a gas station. Just to give you the type of guy he yeah, is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Bobby, I would only see him at church because he's arrested every few months. He was never in my house. But now he, I had the honor and privilege of having Bobby in my house. So now like we're close, we're hanging out. So he was my lookout guy. Right, so I said, you know what, Bobby? I said, take a walk, bro. Just stand outside my cell. I want to sniff these bags, cause now I said, I, if they got the dog, cause sometimes the dogs come and they'll smell it, and then you'll have a problem. They'll find it in two seconds. But it wasn't the dogs. I just wanted to do it. I felt good, but I was greedy. My junkiness was greedy. I felt like maybe I could even get higher and feel better than this, you know. So now I sniff these four bags. He's watching. We go back in the TV room, <clears throat> and I had these Marlboro mediums. In this down cell, I hit him under the thing, and then we roll him with the paper from the hat, the the, the wire from the from the headphones, and you put it on the battery, and then it lights. Okay, so now I'm in this corner. I got a we call them rollies. So I'm smoking a cigarette. I got the pipe, you know, the the screen, because in between cell block cell block, there's all the pipes from the toilet. They call it the pipe chase. That's where we blow the smoke. I'm in the TV room. The camera's in the corner. So where I am, the camera sees out this way. It doesn't see me. So I'm just over there like this. And then I felt something. It felt like my throat was trying to swallow my tongue. It felt like my throat was like, like you know, like that vacuum cleaner? It felt like it was a vacuum cleaner trying to suck my, like choke me. Like take my tongue and choke me. I was like, what? Never felt anything like that. I had a couple overdoses. Before, but it wasn't like that. A couple of you just wake up and there's ambulance in my room. But this one was like, what the hell is this? So then I told this guy, Bobby, I'm going to go lay down. Come check on me in a little bit. And see, I overdosed in my cell. Another guy came by. He said, when I saw you, he said, all you could see was the white. He said, you had your fingers in your mouth and you were trying to pull your tongue out. Wow. Said, yeah, it was crazy, man. Yeah. So then, you know, <clears throat> then I wake up in the hospital. They, they Narcaned me, right? So that I'm in the hospital, I'm in the, well, the infirmary where we go to church. And the kid who sells me the morphine, right? He's in a wheelchair. They got the plexiglass thing. So he could see me wheeled in on a gurney. And he knows he just gave me morphine that day. So he's probably thinking, oh my God, this kid's going to get us all in trouble. I didn't get nobody in trouble. I went and did my time in the box. But 
I seen him when I was born. They were wheeling me in, and I looked at him. He's just like, holy shit. I remember seeing him in the wheelchair. He's looking at me like, damn. So once I, I'm in there, right? And then I realize, like, this, you know, then there's doctors and all these people. Then I realized this was bad, just how serious it was. Now I overdosed. It was a big thing. They taped my cell off as if it was, you know, it was a crime, crime scene. scene. Yeah. Yeah. They taped it off and they wanted me to tell. So they get New York City detectives, they come down. You know, the good guy, bad guy. It was like, it was like, it's like an episode of Law and Order. Like Miami Vice. Right, right, you know? Yeah. So you got one guy one way, one guy the other way. But it's like, I know you guys really don't have anything on me because you would have already made an arrest. You would have said, you're arrested for this and that's it. You wouldn't be asking me these questions. And they're trying to scare me. But I'm thinking to myself, like, dude, I got a murder two charge looming over my head. You right. think I care about this? Right. You know what I mean? So basically, I didn't tell them anything. They couldn't get nothing. And remember, that was Saturday was church. And then this is a Sunday. I got a visit that day. My parents. I go see them on the visit. They have no clue that I just spent the whole night in the hospital. Because they took me to the hospital in Rikers, but then they brought me to an outside hospital. And I was still looking to get high. That's the crazy thing. I was still looking to get high. So they would flip my cell every night, getting me to try to tell and stuff like that. I didn't tell. I went to the box. Okay, they gave me 80 days for that. Wow. Okay, I went away for 80 days. My cousin Pat and my friend Corey Rabin, he's my mentor. He's, a, he's an attorney. He's, he did closings. My dad was a builder. So that's how we met, you know, Corey, Judge Rabin, his dad. Corey's like, you know, he's my, I love the guy. He's like my big brother, my mentor. And he's, he's in recovery as well. He's been in recovery since 82. They come to see me in the box on a visit. And these guys were always like, big part of my support system and always so happy to see me. This day, they weren't happy to see me. I was already sitting there in my brown jumper and I remember when they walked in the room, they just looked at me and it was just so disappointed. And I'd never seen them like this. And uh, they said, you know, you got all these people, we love you, we wanna see you get better, but you're doing this, you're not gonna have anybody. And for some reason, John, that day, that moment, when he said that, it just sunk in. Like, I can't ever do drugs again. Hmm. And it's like when I left that visit, it felt like something had been lifted from me. It felt like a miracle. And I really felt inside different. And I just, once I left, I had to go in a totally different direction. Then I was asking for like legal books. And then I totally, totally got high from different things. Then I started, you know, all the money in my commissary. I would buy like 25 packets of tuna. So then I started bulking up, doing pull-ups. And then I was getting high from that. Because that, you know, those endorphins every day, it was kind of taking the, you know, the place. You never touched a drug again after that. Never again. That was November 18th, 2006. Wow. So last time I got high. Wow. You know, never again. Wow. I have been around drugs. My mom one time told me to go clean my, because my mom and dad slept in different rooms because my dad had the special bed because he was sick. I'm cleaning out his room. He got oxys there. I'm still on parole. I could have took him. Yeah. I could have took him because I didn't have to, but it just, I don't, I don't. I've just learned, I've taught my brain, I think, different things. Like I've said this before, I think like when you're born, there is some kind of predisposition. Maybe, maybe your brain was wired a certain way. But I, th and, and, and the way it's wired, you're obviously going to gravitate to doing drugs because that's the way it's For wired sure. and that's what it wants you to do. Yep. And I think once you do that, you further teach your brain what it already knows, making that much harder later on. But you know what neuroplasticity is? A little bit, but not well, enough. Yeah, tell yeah, me. Yeah, well, the brain changes. Like, trauma changes the brain. You know how people say, like, you know, they, you know, like, oh, man, you won't even remember the bad shit I do. Because that's what your brain allows you to remember. The good stuff, you really have to keep in for it to, like, to, in, you know, get in the, the deeper layers of your brain. But the bad stuff, this is what the brain holds on to. But what I'm saying, the point I'm trying to make is, like, they use the word disease. And sometimes it may be that. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm not saying that it is. But I'm just saying that word sometimes can be discouraging because it's like in the whole community, the addiction community, we we want that stigma erased, right? Because the stigma is a, a big reason why so many people don't come forward That's and right. say, I have a problem, man. Yeah, I'm sick. Because they're going to if they're in fear that somebody's going to make fun of them. Yeah. This piece. yeah, he's a loser. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think when we label it a disease, that stigma is never going to go anywhere. Because you're telling the world, I'm sick. I'm yeah. not like you. Yeah. I'm yeah. sick. You may be. It's maybe true. But I think if you learn a little more about neuroplasticity, 
it gives you hope because I know it did for me because it said I'm not doomed. I may have been born this way, but you know, even with Pavlov's dog, when they ring the bell and they feed him, they undid it by ringing the bell and stop feeding, feeding him. him yeah. And then he knows, that, but I think that's the same with addiction. We're like, you know what I mean? We're primitive. We're very like the brain. That's the way it. And I just think that now, because I'm supposed to have a disease and I've been around drugs and I've been, a, I was one time was like, I had this lady smoking crack. She was like, I, I just heard it and I hadn't heard that scene and I could have easily did it, but it didn't do anything to me inside. So I'm just saying, listen, I don't want to offend anybody by saying it's not a disease, not a disease, because it may very well be that. But sometimes I don't think telling ourselves that it's a disease is the best course of action. And I don't think it benefits us. Doing these drugs, even just cocaine for the first time, that you had this memory in the back of your head, you wanted to get back to it. And it was, I mean, it is in, in a way, a, 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 an ability to dull pain, to, to escape pain, to get out. But you still, you have this case in front of you now. How did you fight that urge, you know, now being incarcerated and, and, and how did that play into it? You know, like, did, did, it, did it help your sobriety or did, did, did it hurt your sobriety? You, well, you know, no, how did that come? It, once I reached a little more clarity, it helped my sobriety because I knew I, I had to be in my best, you know, I had to be my best to be able to help my lawyer because I know things about the case that no one else knows. You know what I mean? So I gotta be able, I gotta be in the right state of mind to be able to help him. So of course, so of course, you know, it was, you know, it was definitely motivating me to stay sober because now, and I kind of, like I said, I was started working out. So I was getting those neurotransmitters and I was feeling, you know what I mean? It got better. It definitely got better. But one advantage that I did have, because I don't want like people, like, the fact that I was incarcerated, it definitely helped me stay sober. Because yeah, you can get drugs, but it's not like you can get in your car and go down the street right. and cop them. Right. You know what I mean? So I use that to my advantage. You know what I mean? Not having that accessibility and just know, and maybe times when you did want to do it, it's not there. And then once you stop obsessing about it, then eventually that kind of stuff goes away. Mm -hmm. It really does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It goes mm -hmm. away. And I think, you know, the beginning part, because it's not only about saying yes or no to drugs. It's about saying I'm okay with changing everything about my life, my friends, the places I go, the things I do. So it's a big decision. It's a life change. You know what I mean? It's a for big, sure. big. So it's like, are you ready for not only that, but for all of this? So how do you do? So what, so what comes next? You come to this conclusion. How long until your trial from then? Okay. So that was the end of, I got out of the box. It was like February 7th, 2007. Okay, so I didn't go to trial till no, uh, November of 2008. So, so I still year. had, you know, a while, a year and a half, you know, something like that. Um, you and you know, the, the wheels of justice turn really slow. Um, and I had the co-defendant. And so it was like two things going on at once. His fate and my fate, even though it was the same case, but we have different involvement. And I was never going to tell on him, right? Because I bought him to that house. You know what I mean? I bought him to that house. He wouldn't have went there on his own. So I got to take some responsibility for that. If I didn't take him there, he wouldn't have never went there. But my lawyer thought it was, uh, you know, it was our, you know, with uh, within our best interest to get a separate case, like to get the case severed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if we went to trial together, him and I, he said that the jury would have probably found you guilty because you're sitting next to the guy who did it, and a lot of the stuff they hear about him, they're going to automatically associate you with. So we, that's why we waited so long. That's why it was like a three year wait. My lawyer said, don't worry, this, this is gonna be worth the wait. If you get a separate trial, you know, you, you'll have a lot better shot. And then we did get the case severance. Um, and then eventually, you know, I did beat the murder case, burglary, two counts of burglary, but then they found me guilty of attempted burglary in the first degree, serious physical injury to a non-participant. So <clears throat> that's what it was. But, you know, I worked out, I get, you learned all about the law, then I was ready. When I got, when it was time for trial and picked the jury, I was ready. I was looking healthy. And uh, he went first, he got found guilty. His trial was like only like 15 days. It was like half a month. They deliberated for like an hour, I heard, and they came back, found guilty, murder one. So uh, my lawyer was, he went to the trial. So it was like, you know, we have a little sneak preview, a lot of stuff. So then we went and I, you know, like I said, I got found guilty of that one, that one count and they gave me 10 years. It was a three and a half to 15 year guideline. They gave me 10 years. It was a little on the high side, 
but because, you know, everything that was going around, they weren't allowed to consider the death and the sentencing, and especially the fact that it was a cop, but they definitely did. There's no way I should have got 10 years for that, but I did, and I think that's the amount of time that I needed away to really go upstate, you know, because now I'm sober. So now I wanted to go upstate. I got my education. I even took college that I paid for, not through the school, because New York State doesn't offer that anymore. They did away with that in the 90s. They, you know, the GED, but no more college. So I figured I'm going to be away for five years. And, uh, you know, I might as well come home with something to show. Like I went to school. I got sober. I did a lot. I did what I was supposed to do. And what that was meant for, I did. When did that When did that click in your head that this is what was meant to happen? Like this this clarity that, that, that you're talking about. Can you just talk a little it, bit about that process? Yeah, it happened when I wasn't found guilty. And I knew I was going to be home and still in my 30s. I'm in my 30s and I'll be home in my 30s. So I'm like, that's not bad. God, I dodged a big bullet. God wants me here for a reason. I have to be the best me. There's no more time to waste. I was making movies. I was doing all this great shit. And then I went and screwed it all up. Somebody's dead. I wasted so much time sleeping my life away. So now I knew I cannot waste any more time. And then I just took everything seriously. You know what I mean? I just, I knew. I knew, I knew school would be important just to learn how to speak better. Because, you know, like when I... Being incarcerated, you only, you know, the, the, the public and the people hear one side of the story because I'm incarcerated, so I'm not saying anything in, in my behalf. It's just what they're saying. But then when I come home, I'm sure people are going to want to hear my side. So I knew it would be in my best interest to speak better and go to school. But it's just like education. And I think after your health, investing in your health, I'd say education has got to be one of the best investments. What, what if anything, do you know about the officer that died? What, what, what have you done or sort of how, how have you explain a little bit about like your relationship with, 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 with that and what, if any responsibility you sort of do, do take in that and how, how, how you kind of articulate that to yourself? Well, I know that my bad decision making and just being with that person and, you know, it definitely made a contribution. There's no way I didn't do it. You know, like, no, yeah. that's, I'm not that guy. Right. I bought the guy there. I didn't know he had a gun, but I bought him there. The guy who shot the cop, um, you know, I did read up a little on the cop. You know, he went to he went you know went to John Jay College. He was a criminal justice major. He was a good son. His parents loved him. He took them to to uh, doctors' appointments and the stuff that I used to do with my dad. And uh, it was very sad. It was very yeah. sad. He was younger than I was. He was twenty eight years old. Wow. And I remember. When I saw the, the funeral, we were in Bellevue. They had the fu the funeral was on TV because you know, like in New York, anywhere when a cop cop gets killed, it's it's big. Yeah. And they had this big funeral, and uh, I remember seeing his dad. He was up in the front. His name was Pedro Enchaltegui. He was up in the front in the wheelchair, and I remember he he looked like my dad. Like he had that old school feel. He was an old school guy. He had the sweater. That just like my dad would have wore, like a, a fancy, like a dressed up sweater. Like, doesn't want to dress up, but all right, I'll throw the sweater on. That's what it looked like to me. You know, that was just like my dad. And just to see the way the guy was like, oh, no, he was crying. Oh, it made me cry. I saw that. And I think, like, I, I partially caused that. That man right there crying for his son. I partially caused that because I didn't want to stop doing drugs when so many people told me, Lilo, you're going to die. Stop you're going to sure. kill somebody. You know? And then this is really when it. But you know now I can, there's nothing I can do. His mom died after that. His father they died from broken hearts. Yeah, they lost his son, and it's like I, I can't do anything to change what has already happened. But I can change me and moving forward and try. Like I said, I dedicated a big portion of my life to giving back and wanting to help people because this is what happens when you're addicted to drugs. There's no saying what's going to happen. People are going to get killed. You're going to kill yourself, and a lot of times not even intentional. But right. it's just this the nature of this beast. And if I could try to educate, you know, educate some people, and, you know, say, you know, if you could just help one person, yeah, that's a great thing. But I want to help more than one person. Yeah, yeah. I want to help as many as I possibly can yeah. to not go down that road yeah. because I had everything. And then just like, you know, and it doesn't discriminate, you know, like I, I did come, my parents, middle class, we were well off. My dad worked his balls off. We all always had what we wanted. And then to get thrown into movies and I had everything, you know, and then when it came to the drugs, there's, you know, all that's right out the window, your moral compass. It's like, you know, so. Was, the, I mean, was there a time where you're like, look, I need this right now. I need to be in here. This is good for me. And then was there a time where you knew, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. I can be of service out there. And could you be of service when, while you were incarcerated? 
Yeah, because there was, you know, there was, I would people would write me and stuff like that. And, you know, people would write me and, you know, say that they're struggling. And, uh, you know, I hope what happened to you doesn't happen to me. Is there any advice you can give me? And stuff What do you like say that. to somebody in that situation? Well, I just, you know, like, you know, I always ask how old they are. And when they're younger, obviously they have a better shot. Yeah. Like, because I always let them know, use that to your advantage. You're young. You have your whole life ahead of you. And it's not like you're so set in your ways where you're doing this for like in 30 years. You're not even 22 years old. You know what I mean? So I try to look at the situation and try to see where their advantage is and what they can use to take them. You know, and I try to emphasize in that and say, listen, you do have a lot more than a lot of people in the battle you're facing right now. Yeah. So you got to use this. Yeah. It's there for a reason. You got to yeah. use it. But then coming home, right, then you got all this. Because my friend started an Instagram page for me. And so many people misuse it and they post bullshit. But I saw this and, you know, and I saw like, as I'm posting stuff, yeah, you get like the whole people that, you know, like respect me and, you know, follow me all that for my acting and stuff like that. But I could see it was a lot more people on my page that were, you know, dealt with, you know, were going through addiction and stuff like that. And as time was going on, I've seen all these people reach out. And I was always posting this inspirational stuff and stuff that I really, like really mean stuff to me. Absolutely. Like, cause I, I, this, this little, whatever it is, I remember going through this exact thing and remember how I felt and I'm going to post this. You know what I mean? So all this, and I guess people were recognizing like this stuff is pretty authentic. Like this guy's pretty real. And then it just got to the point where you got people reaching out and stuff like that. And you got like, you know, grown men and women crying you know, or moms and dads, Lilo, my son, and this and that. And then I remember it was this one time, it was this one time I FaceTimed this this kid, and uh, you know, he was like, oh, I loved you in the Bronx too, I always wanted to be like Calogero, and you know, and and that's when I first saw him, he was like, you know, and he's like, you know, I'm all fucked up on oxys, and I can't stop, and blah, blah, blah. And he was saying, my brother died, and it makes it harder to deal with, and, and I remember I video chatted this guy, and, you know, he was like so happy when he saw him. He's like, oh my God, I can't believe it's you and this and that. And then like we were talking, his kid's name is Phil. And then we were talking and then like, he was he was like staying like in touch with me. Like, hey, Lilo, man, since I spoke to you, I've been, I've been clean for two weeks. It hasn't been easy, bro. But like yeah. you said, it's worth it, man. You know, and then, hey, Lilo. And then, you know, then the kid's mother. Hey, Lilo, I'm Philip's mom. You yeah. know, thank you so much. Cool. You got, you gave me my son back. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. kiddo. I love you. Yeah. If there's anything, I make a really great chicken casserole yeah. and you come yeah. over. But this is real shit. Yeah. This yeah. is real yeah. shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? This yeah. is not the, yeah. you know, this is real stuff. This is a grown woman saying, yeah. you can come to my house. Yeah. I will cook you whatever because yeah. of how you made yeah. me feel. Yeah. And then Better I, than getting in the fucking club with your boys when you right. were, yeah. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's right. that's real power. Yeah. So then it's just like, it's like, wow, this is, the, in this situation, I don't want to use powerful. But before what you were saying with the movies and people, that is powerful. Yeah. But this, I don't want to use this powerful because it sounds. It can be of service. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, because it helps me too. Yeah. It's that's symbiotic. Right. That's right. It benefits you and me. Yeah. This is how I stay plugged in. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, yo, I'm telling these guys, you know, these kids, you know, yo, we meet up, we go have coffee. And I like, you know, man, you could see already, I like to joke around. Yeah. And I don't yeah. shut up. Yeah. So, you know, so these kids are laughing and stuff like that. And they see like, maybe we could do something else with my life. Look at this. This is great laughing. I wasn't laughing. We were doing drugs and stuff like that. But when you're telling someone to live their life a certain way and what they should do and what they shouldn't do, my opinion, not that I'm, you know, my opinion, this is what you should do. Live your life like that now. Absolutely. In order for that person to prosper yep. and to get from you what was meant for them to get, part of it is you doing your, your, your end. You and have, that both motivates you, it holds you to it. Right, because right. if I say, God forbid, I just talk to these kids, I love them, they're such good kids. If I go fuck up right now, they right. may say, oh, look at Lilo fucked up, who cares? That's right. And, and I that would also, kid ends up dead. That's right, that's right. And I would also say to the same extent, man, that you know whether you want to use the word power or whatever you want to say, but you know, you know, there's, again, a lot of people I get the pleasure to talk to. I would say you're in this enormously... Uh, incredibly, I would say powerful position because I think only when you've actually really been in that valley, you know, for these kids, you know, like, 
anybody can come say, hey, man, I think you should change your life. Like, I'm just saying, like, I see what you're doing. I think you should change it up. But for you to be like, hey, like, I've been where you've been. I've been, I've been, I've, I've seen it all. And, and, and I think there is, it's like only those that have been in that valley can be up on the mountain and reach and up they and pull people up there. It, yeah, they know when it's real. They, they know recognize when it's real. It. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they don't want, nobody wants to get preached at by, by, by somebody, right? Yeah. But it's like, hey, look, man, like I care for you because I've been yeah. there. I see yeah. me and in I you. And I know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, can yeah. see it. So before it happens, why don't you stop? Because I'm telling you it's going to happen. So don't let it happen for you to see it. I'm yeah. telling you it happened to me. You know, like we had this guy like upstate, like he was, a, you know, ASAT, a alcohol and substance abuse treatment. Yeah. You know, the counselor was this guy. He was fake as shit. The guy yeah. drank beer like three times in college. Right, 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 like, right, well, right. I'm climbing through grown people's windows in the right, middle of the night right, trying right. to get high. Anybody who has been down, you know, in that valley, like we talked about. They've dealt with things where they're, they're horribly ashamed, they're horribly embarrassed, they're horribly disgusted with parts of yourself, but, but you have to move past that. Like the only way to combat about it is not about what other people think about you. No. Got but, but, but I'm just wondering, how do you deal with that? How, how present is that in your life and how does that make you feel? And I'm just wondering, what, like, what is your relationship with law enforcement now? Like how, how do you feel about that? You know, collectively when they're like you know when it's online and stuff like that they always have to take the position like this kid but when i see them on the street like one you know individually a lot of them are really cool i've always gotten along with cops like when i'm before i got in trouble they loved me man you know like when i was out in the city and stuff oh go load your own, take pictures with the cop i've always had respect for the cops and i still have respect for the cops that you know that happened that night and it happened to be a cop but I would say it's definitely better than it was. And you're right. You know, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, the mind is the source of all of our woes. And I can't, you know, like if I think about this stuff and let it get to me, it's going to be my demise. It's going to, it's going to kill me. The stress is going to kill me. Um, so the way I deal with it is like, just pe keep putting good out in the world. That's it. Be kind. Good for you. How can somebody say anything about that? Yeah, 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 they're gonna yeah. say, "What do you think?" I say, "What do you believe that guy alone, man? Yeah, he's been yeah, home. He's yeah, been yeah. nothing but good. He helps yeah. people. Yeah. Come on, bro. We know he didn't shoot the guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but the fact still remains that there's somebody's, you know, somebody's dead, and yeah. this service is something I'm gonna do forever. This is something you're gonna be doing forever. Yeah, um, it's something that, like you said, it motivates you. It keeps you. It, it, it's as much for you as it is for them. You're always going to fail. You're always going to come up short. You're never going to be the perfect actor. You're never going to be the perfect father. You're never going to be the perfect husband. But it's something that you can keep working on, keep getting better at. And that running into walls is the thing. Like, if I could just get a little better. And that, that's my high. That's my buzz, you know, to keep working. Where do you feel like you are with service right now? Like, where do you feel like, how do you look at it? Well, you know, there's always room for improvement, especially within ourselves. Like a lot of this stuff that I speak on in these videos I don't want to speak as an authority like I know everything. This is some of the stuff, things that I struggle with. So as time goes on and I learn how to deal better with these things that I'm struggling with, I could be of better service. For sure. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So it's like while you're helping me get better, I'm going to help what you, you better later with? on. What, what are you I'm struggling better. with right now? Sometimes I don't have patience. Um, sometimes, you know, you know what it is? I got a big heart and, you know, I just can't understand when I'm kind to someone and they're not as kind, but that's just the world. That's yeah. human nature. Yeah. Not everyone's yeah. going to be like that. Yeah. And my aunt's like that too. She struggles with that and she's a little worse than me. Yeah. So sometimes it helps me because I look at that and say, I don't want to be like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I love her to death. She was yeah, always yeah. there. But I just think that, you know, I just think that everyone's an individual. We can't expect them to be the way you want. Acceptance. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Acceptance. Yeah. That's my aunt used to say that in her answer machine. Uh, what is it? enjoy your day as is. Yeah, enjoy yeah, yeah. your day at the end of the thing as is. So accept it. I like that. Whatever yeah. it is, yeah. enjoy it yeah. as is. Yeah. yeah. And you got to take people for what they are as is. And you know, and just that's one thing I don't I don't have patience because I feel that I wasted so much time in my life. For sure. That time is always of the essence. For sure. Like what was in in the and Alice in Wonderland is that guy. He's always running around. What the, was it Alice in Wonderland? It's one of those cartoons. But he's always seems like, he always feels like he's late. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what I feel like. I don't yeah. Because I feel like I've wasted so much already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. I got to get going. Yeah. But things work better when you're patient. What are some of your, uh, what do you want? Like, what do you want to do? What are some of your goals? Like, what, it, what like, five years from now, uh, what, what, what it, to see yourself, like, what, 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 what do you see? Like, what, what, what would be, 
what would be beautiful for you? Or do you not think like that? No, I, I do. Um, you know, like I said, I, I'm at a treatment center in, in Jersey, more life recovery. Um, I'd like to maybe have a place of my own, mm -hmm. a place of my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I still love, love acting and mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. and, you know what? I've, I've started writing a little bit. Beautiful. And, uh, you know, I kind of like that. It's very therapeutic. Yeah. Because it's like it's a there's a purpose for all this pain that I went through. Yep. I wrote a film called Never Meet Your Heroes. Okay. It's going to be with the girl from A Bronx Tale. Oh, beautiful. We're not the same characters from the film. Yeah. I'm a gambler. Yeah. She's a, you know, mom's a nurse. She's an aspiring singer. We meet in a, a karaoke place yeah. in our element. She's singing on the stage and I'm at the Joker Poker. We fall in love. We have a daughter. She becomes an addict. And it's like this parts of my life weaved into this beautiful, story. Beautiful. It's pretty good screenplay. Beautiful. So this is the kind you of- You made that already or you're going to no, make No, no, no. It's written. Uh -huh. um, it's written. I'd like to do it probably like the fall beginning of next year. Beautiful. Because you know this, I always keep in mind like when you <clears throat> when you don't have $900 million to make a movie, you want to keep your crew happy. And when you're shooting in January and February and they're freezing their nuts off and not making any money, it's going to be hard to keep them happy. Yeah. So yeah, I try to think of the months when there's not going to be Christmas mites everywhere yeah, yeah, yeah. or it's going to be too cold for my crew or too hot for my crew. Right. So there's those few months because yeah. with the money we're going to have, but I, I'm, I, I got some pretty good ideas and it's, I've had some people read it. They really like it. Um, so, you know, that, like that's what I want to do. Like things, you know, like things that people would like, look at my life and say, oh my God, I can't believe, but I want to write about this stuff. Absolutely. Because like, I've seen it from the inside looking out, like I've seen it, I've lived this. And I'm, you're going to, you're going to feel that the nuances and just the way like this is, you know, even in this, that the whole psychosis and never meet your heroes, there's stuff in this film. I've seen a lot of films about drugs and stuff that they really haven't touched on that is going to be in this film. Yeah. So this, uh, you know, I really... I never thought, like, that's one thing. I always, like, thought it would be cool to direct. And when I'm on sets, I like to see the different lenses. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a, that's a pretty interesting choice, the way he's choosing to shoot this. Yeah. He's got that on a sandbag over there. I would have yeah. did it this way, but yeah, I don't yeah. know. That's all right, though. <laughs> right? Absolutely, man. But that was cool. And yeah. the acting, we know, was cool. We yeah, love yeah. it. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. And I always thought, like, writing was going to be like, I can't, how do I do this? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Do do you just go sit down and do start. it. Yeah. Well, you got to do it. You got to start. Just like anything else. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but now, like, you know, like, even though I, I can't, like, I'm embarrassed to say this, but even though, like, I've read 900 million scripts, when I wrote my first script, the margins were a little off. Somebody said, you got to get the margins. But it was still there. What do you mean the margins? You ever see, like, all right, the, the thing here and then all the margins straight down. There's nothing, like, this is the margin. Do you know what I mean? You mean, like, on the fucking page? The Who margin. gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck? No, but it's, but it's not... If you say if I'm sending you a script and yeah. you see these margins all fucked up, yeah. say who the fuck wrote this? I one, mean, I mean, year old kid wrote this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if the writing's good, I don't know that. You know, I mean, maybe. Well, did you write it on Final Draft? No. Well, then I met some guy at a diner. He put it all together. Okay, got it. I started with index cards. Yeah, bro. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had them on index I cards. I get it. I, I, I wish you so much. I, I, I bet you're great at it. I bet you're great i'd be so curious i like to think i'm okay hey listen man i mean i just think that like the point is is that it's a way to express it's a way to be an artist very, on your own nobody's yeah. got to give you permission to do it and it's very therapeutic absolutely and i think you know you know what it is also you know because bronx tale was like such a prominent it was like such a you know big film yeah. and so many people love it and it's like that character of Colojuro, when i go on auditions and stuff like that it's very easy for them to send me these this these type of scripts mm -hmm. where it's an Italian guy. It's like you left one set, you're playing Vito, yeah. and then you go play Dominic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't even know it's a different dressing room. Yeah. It's the same yeah, wardrobe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. get the silk shirt. You know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah, enough yeah. of this. Yeah, I can't yeah, do yeah. this anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's like, I don't know, I'm almost embarrassed to keep showing the world. Like, you know, or you already know I can do this. Yeah. It yeah. almost feels like I'm greedy, getting a paycheck, selling out doing this shit when you know I can do it. Yeah. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, unless it's like Scorsese. Yeah, says, I get hey, it. Lilo, I get, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? I get it. Somebody I get like it. that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But you know what I mean? I so do. it's like Hollywood's not going to see you the way you want them to That's see right. you. That's right. So you got to write this. The way you want to be seen is the way you have to write it. That's it. Because you know this is my strength. 
my strengths, my weaknesses. You know what I mean? This, like this is one thing I can't. Flaws, I never, your ugglinesses, yeah, your weaknesses. I can weaknesses. never really. I was never good at crying. So we're gonna. We're gonna this, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna. This character's not gonna cry too much. Yeah. Or make but, him cry every scene. You yeah. Know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I cry. Yeah, like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like stop. a little bitch. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cry, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crying. That's the name yeah, of the movie. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but now I know, like these little, no one's ever like, like a lot of these films, like. I like you know, I like to be funny, yeah. and a lot of these parts I play never really shows that side of me. Everybody yeah. took something, and now what, what happened? Everybody's got to go. This guy, like you know, he's going to go yeah. on the set. Everybody got to get quiet. Yeah, 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 Piece yeah, of yeah. you know, it's paper, and then we have all of this in here, and all this goes on there, and it's like it's like you know, and then just for the world to see it, like wow, I can't believe this guy had this up yeah, there yeah, and yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, that's the most special thing. Like I've almost like it more than acting now. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful man, that's great. Yeah. You know, you ain't got to ask permission to do it. I mean, that's yeah. the best, the best part. And is there anybody right now, uh, or anybody that you can think of in your time? Like when I say, like, who's inspired you the most? Who 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 pops in your head? I would, uh, I would say my mentor Corey Rabin. I mentioned him earlier. Um, you know, he's in recovery as well. He's in his sixties. He was my dad's real estate lawyer, and when I was away, he he's got a, a, a podcast called Crosstalk. But still, to this day, we're still, he's still, we're still very good friends, and he just motivates me, mm -hmm. and he just tells me little things. Like sometimes he'll just out of nowhere text me. Remember what I said? Stay in your lane. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Just stay in your lane. And I, it's like not, once again, not profound advice, but it's like, you know how effective that is if you just mind your business, yeah, yeah, yeah. how much further you go in life, yeah. and just stay in your lane. Yeah. This is like you know what I mean. So what do you? How, how long you been out now? Oh, I've been out over ten years. Ten years. Yeah, ten you years. know, like it's like. They want to write in the newspaper. You got all these people saying, oh, this cop killer piece of shit. But it's like, why don't you write that I've been home for 10, 10 years, years and I've and not been like, in trouble once? Yeah, yeah, How yeah, about yeah. that? Yeah. Let's do a little, you know what I mean? Let's. Yeah. yeah. But that's not the way it is. Yeah. yeah. You know? No, 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 no. You yeah. know, it's all about selling papers. Yeah. You got anything? You got anything else that you want to say or talk about or anything you want to ask me? I just, I always do that kind of at the end, dude. I, I, this has been awesome, bro. Like, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that you did it and, and like, I'm I'm excited to uh, stay in touch with you, man. I'm excited, like I, I yeah, man. Like I, I I I really love to continue continue this and be be a real friend. You know, what I mean, I, yeah, I would no, dig that, bro. And likewise, and you yeah. know, and when people ask, like you know, like who would you want a career like? I'd yeah. say like you, oh, man. Geez, and I've yeah, said yeah, that yeah. before. Yeah. You know, like we're real yeah, guys. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. like where you are is is perfect. You're oh, great thanks, at what man. you do. Thank You're you, always bro. every time. Oh. Because at first I didn't know your name. Not yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I do now and I have yeah, for a yeah, while. Yeah, but in yeah. the beginning I first saw you. It's that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I was yeah, like, yeah. yo, who is this yeah, guy? Yeah, like the yeah, first yeah. time I saw you was with the yeah. with Scorsese. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's the money. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. This, like you have a real presence. Yeah, thank you, bro. Doesn't you too, matter man. who. You too. Doesn't matter who else is on that screen. Yeah. When John Bernthal goes yeah, out. Yeah, oh, there he is. Oh, I like this guy. I like this guy. So that's what it is. You know what I mean? I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Likewise, man. Likewise, bro. Likewise. That's the only. How beautiful, right? The architect. But uh, yeah, and I mean that too. But I we did this other film called Sleepyhead. Okay, it's pretty cool. Okay, um, that, what's that? That's I'll show out. you the trailer. Yeah. That's out now. No, we're, that's we're coming. We're, yeah, yeah, it's nice. it's a double entendre. Okay, it's uh, it's two. They called Sleepyhead for two reasons. Okay. I can't really tell you. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah, yeah, but when it comes, but it's cool, dude. It's cool. Yeah, I'd love to see that trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. uh, thank, thank you, you for having me. Yeah, fucking no. It's yeah, when my manager said, "Oh, John, yeah, little, do you want to do it?" I was of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice, She's a big man. fan as well. Oh, tell her I said hello, man. Yeah, nice, course. nice. All right, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank you, man. That's great. Unless you get a fit. I didn't realize you were that tall. What's that? Is he tall? I'm not...